We're good. It looks like we're live Friday afternoon in the local studio. As you can see behind me, it's quite beautiful with the new backdrop. And the guest for today, Hotep Jesus, who actually has a, a name that's, I thought that was his real name for a little while, and then I Googled it, and turns out it's Brian, Brian Sharp. Uh, how he got the nickname Hotep Jesus is great, and we're going to get into it. Uh, I came across Hotep Jesus. Actually, I think I've known about him before I knew that I knew about him because there was this viral video, uh, it's going to be four years ago now, really? of somebody walking into a Starbucks asking for a free coffee for reparations, and the video went viral. Hotep ended up on Joe Rogan, but um, we're going to get into all of this. I was on Hotep's channel last week mm -hmm. following his interview with Scott Adams, following Scott Adams' cancellation for having said something in a way, uh, whether or not it was a troll, whatever. We're going to get into all of this. You all know the news. Uh, for the time being, sit back and enjoy because it's going to be amazing. Hotep, nice to meet you in person. Thank you for coming in. He came in uh, from out of state. Yes. And uh, for this interview only and is going... I'm joking, he's spending the weekend here, but came in for this, and I'm extremely flattered and honored. Hotep, thank you for being here. Absolutely. You know, I you know, I just thought it was a, a great excuse. We spoke last week on my channel, and you said you wanted to uh, connect, and um, I was like, oh, it's a good excuse to go to Miami. I'll go hang out with Viva. Like, why not? So it's good to be here. It's an, well, for, it's an amazing place. You're, you're coming down from upstate. I'm coming from, you know, Canada, yeah. where it's actually still winter, and you sort of forget that there's more than one season in a year when you live down there. Yeah. Here. Yeah, that's how it was when I got off the plane a day. I was like, oh, I have to take my coat off. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> okay, Hotep. Yeah. Let's start from the, before we even get to the beginning, the 30,000 foot overview mm -hmm. uh, of who you are for those who don't know. Mm. And everybody who's watching now knows that I delve into childhood immediately after, like, history, childhood, to get to the present. But 30,000-foot overview, who are you for those who've never heard of you? I don't know how to answer. How, <laughs> how, how, do, how have people in the past answered that question? What, what does that mean? The like, elevator pitch. You're, you're on, you get two floors to I go with someone. I am terrible. At my, let, me, let me tell you, like, my elevator pitch is trash. <laughs> terrible. And I think about this all the time. And I just don't know what it is. So I have a, a joke. I say I'm a reincarnated ascended master. That's my that's my elevator pitch. Well, now I've got to ask you what that actually even means. A reincarnated, yeah, ascendant master. Yeah, ascended. Yeah, ascended has risen. Um, I don't know. Yeah. So, you know, studying the brain, um, some people have um, more parts of the brain turned on than others, and certain parts of the brain are more activated than others. Um, and some people like, they just come into this world and they just don't get it at all. Right. Um, and I, I feel like I sort of had this natural affinity to this world. And the only thing I can really, uh, attribute that to is a past life. I've been here before. So I, I'm a person who believes in reincarnation. And I think I've probably been here a few times and the previous time, you know, uh, I think I was somebody uh, of importance. And when we talk about my childhood, you understand why I say that. Uh, I think I did something right in my last life because of the great fortune I have in this life. So that's, and then that's when the ego comes in and I say I'm a reincarnated ascended master to make it a joke and, you know, make me seem more grandiose than what I am. That, might, that but, we might already be getting into the nickname or the uh, internet name of Hotep Jesus. Yeah. So, so let's, we'll go back all the way and we're going to get to, some people watching now might say, uh, this sounds like a conspiracy theory and the internet has has you firmly labeled as one of them fringe theorists as well. Yeah. We're going to get there, people. Uh, you are 42 years old. Yeah. Um, born and raised in America. Yes. Parents? Yes. Dad, mom. Uh, dad from Jamaica. My mother is uh, from America. Uh, my mother's side of the family is Southern. They okay. all come from um, Georgia. Um, and, uh, really like deep South roots, you know, um, amazing, amazing, huge family. I have like a huge family. So on my mom's side, I literally in just New Jersey alone have a gang. <laughs> There's you, uh, 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 in, in the familial sense, or in the familial in the, sense, okay. <laughs> in the familial sense, like literally I could call. 30 different people, my family, minimum, 
minimum and we and haven't even got to the kids ish, like aunt uncle nieces nephew type no thing? cousins okay it's it's branched out from cousins um second cousins first cousins then you know kids of cousins kids of cousins aunties um great aunties daughters of great aunties just a humongous family uh you know when we had our family unit at its peak i think maybe 200 people would show up at That's the amazing. family unit yeah so huge um you know, on my mom's side and then my dad's side, he's from Jamaica, a lot smaller, uh, a lot more diverse, uh, where my grandma, I believe she was born in Panama. Grandma on your dad's, dad's side. side. Yeah. Okay. And I believe her dad was German. So I'm actually Caucasian. <laughs> actually Caucasian blood in me. Um, and my dad was born and raised in Jamaica. Um, and his dad, I think his dad might have had a white mom too. I don't remember, but I got a lot of weird mixture going on on my dad's side, but a lot smaller, spread out. Like I got family in Australia, I got family in Jamaica and Canada. Uh, so the, yeah, so I grew up with this like American Caribbean background. So it's, you know, a lot of culture, but yeah, really cool. And on the mother's side, how many generations American? This, this I've always found fascinating because yeah. a lot of people are able to trace it back a lot yeah. further than I have ever been able to trace back my family from, from Europe. How, yeah. Do you know how many generations? Like all the way back to slavery. Okay, I mean, it's, it's, it's Like my mom's, okay, so my, grand, my great grandma was a slave. Like literally a slave. In, in Georgia? In Georgia. Okay. I believe in Georgia, yeah. Yeah, uh, we got some family, they were sharecroppers. We got the old like black and white photos, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, like my lineage on that side is like deeply rooted in America, yeah. All right, and yeah. now how many, well, first of all, what did your parents or what do your parents do and how many siblings? Uh, my mother was an accountant for a Fortune 500 company. Um, I was raised an only child. Uh, I have a half brother and half sister from my dad's previous marriage. Um, and they're like super successful. I was like the black sheep of the family because, you know, I was the kid that never did good well in school, never kept a good job. My sister, she's like a doctor. My brother's like this IT guy for a big bank. Uh, my dad was um, uh, an electrician uh, and uh, electrical inspector. So um, I have sort of this like blue collar, white collar upbringing it's because my mom's coming from corporate America. My dad's coming from the blue collar electrician. So, you know, I was raised um, very proper. Uh, my mother was religious. Uh, I was uh, actually um, um, confirmed Catholic. Okay. Yeah. So I went to the Catholic church, went through the whole, you know, baptism, communion, you know, the whole nine all the way through to confirmation. So I was raised Catholic um, because that's, um, uh, on my dad's side, my grandma was Catholic, that whole thing. Um, so, yeah, so my mom um, was really, you know, on me about like speaking proper English. And she was actually a college professor. So uh, one of the classes she taught in college was language arts. Um, and then my dad was this Jamaican guy who, you know, drank beer, cussed was a conspiracy theorist, you know? <laughs> so he was more right. He was more right than most more often. We'll, yeah. we'll get there, people. Yeah, so like my, my dad is like right wing, you know what I mean? Um, so I would go on jobs with them. So, you know, we you know, work on houses, work on jobs, sheetrock, painting, all of that. So I have this like diverse background between white and blue collar, which sort of makes me really very uh, well-rounded. All right, and... Uh uh, we won't spend too much time. Private school, public school. What was and where? Did, what yeah. state did you grow up in? Jersey. Okay. Yeah. So I did private, and then um, when we moved to a better neighborhood, I went to public. Um, probably should have stayed private, um, but public school was cool. I basically grew up about around uh, a bunch of white kids. It was weird for me because I went from going from a class, a school where there was maybe what one white kid in the class to uh, a place where it was all Italians and I was the one black kid in the class. I think it might've been two black kids in my grade school at the time. So that was like a, a bit of a culture shock for me and hard to get adjusted to. And uh, I went through it. Um, they weren't exactly kind to me, <laughs> you know? Um, 
but yeah, so yeah, that was my school background. All right, and now okay, so out of school, relatively, well, you actually sound like you have a pretty standard, normal childhood. No uh, massively traumatic events that I've been able to decipher within no. short order. No. Um, what do you study in university, and how do you get into? First, of all, you, what you're doing now is you're online. You 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 do live interviews. Uh, I know you do marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you've done marketing. Yeah. I won't say the claim to fame that's sort of minimizes someone's existence to one event, but what put you on the national or international scene was that video back in 2019. But how do you get into doing what you're doing even, you know, five years before that? And what were you doing? Oh, um, so I was a touring artist. Uh, I was in a group, Demick in Boston, and uh, Demick is this really um, genius cat who um, it was very interesting because we both came up with our own record labels and we had a mutual friend group. So his friend was signed to my record label and he really didn't like me. He looked at me like a, like this Diddy character because I always wore suits. At the time I worked in the mortgage industry. So I always wore suits and you know, whatever, whatever. And then um, my artist got incarcerated. And then I was just like, then the, uh, well, the housing bubble hit um, bust. So I was unemployed. My career was over after doing like mortgages. I thought I was going to do that for the rest of my life. Um, and then, uh, well, you know, until the rec rec uh, recording industry, you know, treated me well. And then my artist got incarcerated. So then I was like, then my parents moved and I was sleeping on my friend's couch. And I was just like, what, what kind of music was it? Hip hop. Okay. And I've got to ask, cause I, what did he get incarcerated for? Um, possession of a firearm illegal possession of a firearm okay yeah um so yeah so i was sort of just sitting on the couch trying to figure out what i was gonna do i had i started up a photography business and then demic came along and was like yo you want to like create a rap group and it was funny because we're the both uh are the business minds of our crews so we came together business mind business mind and we had like this meteoric success. Like we were nationally touring, you know, performing for a thousand and thirty thousand people, arenas. Amazing, amazing. He's a genius. And he added my genius with it. And we just went really far. And then um, I started up a, a entertainment blog because I just wanted to get more hits on our music. So I figured if I start up an entertainment blog, you know, I could do some native advertising or whatever. Um, and then, uh, I covered the, uh, 50 cent energy drink story on my website and they invited me out. And then, uh, while I was on the bus, I, um, well, actually before we even get there, cause there's, there's a lot to this story, which I mean, you, you, I know it cause I've heard it. I've heard you tell it in some interviews that I was watching. Yeah. You, you, how did you get involved with the 50 cent energy drink? This is after vitamin water. Yeah. He had already, I believe he already cashed out. Uh, of vitamin water by this time and this at this point he was like i guess reinvesting his cash into new brands okay so um yeah so my media outlet did the story um his pr team reached out to me and said hey we'd like to invite you to this launch what does it mean doing the story you, you just cover the energy drink in, yeah i i large yeah i mean i was a big 50 cent fan i love 50 cents music his brand i thought it was very inspiring uh, I thought he's an intelligent businessman. So I saw an article or hit the wire about his energy drink. And I was like, oh, this is cool. So I wrote about it. Um, and because, you know, I wrote about and covered the energy drink, that's how they reached out to me. And then they said, hey, you'd like to come to launch? I'm like, oh, yeah, I'd love to come to launch. Keep in mind, at this time, I probably had about 30 bucks to my name. <laughs> so, um, in fact, I think I borrowed money from my parents to get there. Um, I remember one time, I got another story for you, right? So one time I was, um, I feel so bad for this guy now. Um, I auditioned for a uh, fashion show for Russell Simmons Fat Farm at Macy's. I lost. I'm sitting at the job, mortgage industry, da, da 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 I just started in the mortgage industry. And then I got a call and they said, hey, the dude who won dropped out. Would you like to come? So I go do the show. The lady's fitting me. She's like, oh, my God, you're so small. She's like, you know, whatever, whatever. So I do that. And I didn't have any money to get back home. I only had money to get there. <laughs> but I was like, I'm not going to miss this opportunity. I'll figure out how I'm going to get home. Um, went to the after party, got super drunk. 
don't even know how I got to Newark Penn Station. Somehow I got to Newark Penn Station. And then um, I told his uh, driver, this is before Uber. I told the taxi driver, hey, when I get to the house, I'll give you the money. I had no money. So I had him drop me off. I was staying with my friend at this time. I had him drop me off on this street. My friend was on this street. Um, and then I hopped the fence and he was, the taxi driver was honking a horn all night. I just want to find a guy and give him the money back because I feel so bad, but I had to get home. This is, uh, I actually knew a story that started like that and ended much worse in Montreal. It was, it, it, it made, uh, big news where, oh, I forget the exact details, but bottom line, if someone tried to skip the fare and, uh, it, it didn't end well, but that's mm. cause they didn't do it the way you did it. Yeah. Um, so, you, you, so yeah, so you're in, but you're in, you're in the, the mortgage industry pre 2008. Yeah. And so when 2008 this, happens, yeah. I mean, what, what are you, pra what are you doing actually? Like, for, okay. Well, practically so speaking and then what do you do? Like after the, the crisis. So, um, I was killing it in the mortgage industry. Uh, so much so that, uh, I ended up going to, um, so this guy, Max, I worked with, I used to pre-qualify all his loans. I was the kid in the office that could pre-qualify loans in my head. I was really good with numbers. So, um, he he always had all the deals because he went to this church and everybody at this church loved him. So he'd have like 20 deals on the board. So he left and started his own bank. So he called me up like, yo, come with me. So I went over there. So I was like uh, assistant branch. Well, he was the owner. I was like branch manager, assistant branch manager, whatever. And uh, I was killing it. I hired a couple of my friends. They came on board. We were killing it. And then one day I went to go like pre-call a loan. I called up Delta and a, a gentleman, I think it was Delta, but a gentleman I always talked to, his name was Lee Duncan. I'll never forget this. And I said, um, yo, Lee, I got a loan right here. Um, the last guy's name was uh, Gardner. And um, he said, yo, it's over. And I'm like, yo, I just need to pre-call the loan. He was like, yo, it's over. I'm like, what do you mean? He said, it's over. Then he hung up on me. I'm like, what is he talking about? I'm, you got to remember, like, I'm selling, like, I'm doing predatory lending and don't know it. They're telling me to sell, like, three-year arms, tell people that, you know, like, my boss is telling them, J just say that the house is going to go up in value in a few years and they'll be able to refi out of it. I was doing reverse mortgages, cozy loans you know, 1% mortgages. It was ridiculous in hindsight. But in, in, when I'm doing it, I don't know I'm doing predatory lending. I'm doing predatory lending, I'm selling the stuff. And then I made another call to pre-call the loan. Nobody picked up. I must've called like 10 banks and nobody picked up. This has never happened before, okay? Usually you call, somebody picks up the phone because we're a brokerage. That was it, bro. Everything was just, I couldn't, I couldn't get a loan qualified. I mean, I'm sitting there with files of loans, you know, each loan was probably worth anywhere from two to five K to me. Um, I didn't save any of the money cause I thought this was forever. So I was blowing money fast, you know, the finest suits, finest clothes, you know, taking my girlfriend out and it was just over. So like, I mean, I, I, remember where I was, but I was a lawyer at the time. I mean, I'm still a lawyer now, but I was practicing. I remember I was at Borden Landers Chef and I remember the, the impact it had on the market, but I wasn't paying attention to any of it at yeah. the time. I mean, you effectively overnight go from having a job to not having a job. I had a career. I had a career, you know, like I didn't go to college. I, I thought college was stupid because I was smarter than everybody in my class. I was smarter than my teacher. You know, I just didn't respect college. So I thought I had a career. My career was gone and I just didn't know what to do. You know, I was just, and I, I actually, I never knew what happened until I watched the movie, the big short. When I watched the movie, the big short, I was like, Oh, wow. <laughs> I didn't know anything about financial products. I just knew there were 30 year loans, 15 year loans. You got to find an LTV. What's their level of income? What's their debt to income ratio? You know, get the W2, W2 forms. We were doing no doc loans, right? Like just give me the value of your house and I'll lend off of that. Just we'll make up whatever your income is. They called it a no doc, no documentation. It was crazy, man. But in hindsight, I'm like, 
oh my God, I was part of this thing that's in this movie. And now I'm sort of educated on, you know, what predatory lending is and the 2008, but I'm like, I lived that. I, that, that was me and I was zeroed out, man. So, and what do you do after that? You have to find a new career, redefine yourself and you're close to 30 years old at this time, give or take. I was 25. Yeah, I was 25. Um, well, I was good at social media. I was always killing it on social media. So I, um, I, and I had the record label, but now the record label's basically shut down because I couldn't finance it, right? I was bankrolling the whole thing. We weren't making any money off the off the music back in the day. And there's no streaming platforms. You had to like print CDs, you know? And then you had to take them to the, um, to the radio station, you know? And it was a real hustle. Um, but yeah, it is, um, I, I, I just pivoted into, um, I had a camera because, you know, record label, we needed photos, we needed content. So I had a camera. So I just pivoted into a photography business just to make ends meet, you know? So I'm like hustling, trying to do a, a photo shoot here, photo shoot there. I'm going to the skating rink and popping up with a printer, printing out photos, taking put photos, getting booked at clubs, you know, take photos for the clubs, you know, just whatever, a hundred bucks there, a hundred bucks here just to make ends meet. I had a daughter at the time. So, you know, I had to take care of her. Um, yeah. And, you know, that's when, you know, Demick hit me up and he said he wanted to, you know, go on tour. And it was funny because one of the shows we had was in Miami and uh, I had about a hundred bucks in my name and um, I spent it on the flight and uh, we had a sponsor and a sponsor took care of our hotel. Um, so I just had to have like, you know, uh, money for the last three days or something like that. So in, to make a long story short, um, Demick flew back, our sponsor flew back, but we did such a great job at the show. Some Native Americans from a casino, like let me stay at their hotel room for the rest of like two more days. And then I begged them to buy me a hotel room because they were leaving like Monday and, and I, my flight was until Tuesday. Yeah, I remember I paid a hundred bucks for the ticket because it's on odd days. Mm -hmm. So I had to fly out like Wednesday or Tuesday or something like that. So he was gone. So I stayed there an extra day and um, kind of just scraped by. But, you know, I was, we were um, uh, cliffhanging. Demick used to call it cliffhanging where you just, you know, I remember one time I was working at Bonefish Grill and we had a show to do. And um, I, 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 you know, you got to request off. I didn't get the day. They wouldn't give me the day. You know, I was the new kid there. I still went to the show and I called in. I was like, yo, I'm not coming to work today. I like you're fired. I'm like, OK, I'm still going to do this show. I was the type of person where it was just like I'm doing these jobs, but I have to do what's got a higher trajectory for longevity. So I was choosing music over that. Uh, I was choosing my blog over that, and it and it paid off. Like at the time, I looked crazy. But well, for sure. I mean, it, it's it, it's the uh, Kurt Vonnegut is life is about jumping off cliffs and growing wings as you fall down. But yeah, so you get into marketing, and then this actually started from the original story with getting invited to the launch for uh, Fifty Cent's yeah. new energy drink, which is to be distinguished from vitamin water. It was sort of a high sugar, high caffeine drink. Yeah, I, I had never heard of it, but um, now I have. Yeah. So you get invited to the to the launch, and what does the launch look like? I mean, is, is 50 Cent there with, with, it's, with crew? It's, yeah, so there's this big, um, you know, the double-decker buses in New York? Yeah. So it's one of those, except it's wrapped with the branding. And um, I walk up, and uh, I get on the bus, and I'm very strategic, so I go to the front knowing he's going to sit there. And then when he comes, the security is like, no, you got to move. Go to the back. So they move me to like right behind him, like a row or whatever. And then um, the bus pulls off and um, I'm an entertainer. So it was quiet. And but we're in New York City. So I'm feeling the energy of the air. But the bus is quiet. I'm like, this doesn't add up. So the bus takes off and it stops. And I'm like, yo, just jump up and just yell, like whatever, whatever. So I get up and I go, yo, I'm on a bus with 50 cent. To like people, because there's like a whole crowd right here. It's New York City. So when you stop at the light, you know, it's people waiting <laughs> so to cross. You shouted this to people outside the bus. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm on the top of the bus. It's a massive security breach. <laughs> now people are going to yes, stop the bus. <laughs> exactly. They loved it. They're like, wait, grab him. Move him to the front next to 50. So they grabbed me, put me back where I started at. And then now they gave me a shirt, they gave me a hat, and they were like, keep doing that. I guess 
in, in, so in hindsight, what happened was they hired a marketing company, but the marketing company didn't really have an execution for on the bus. They were just going to record, you know, capture content. But when I added that element, they're like, oh, this is perfect. So it gave it that like third dimension. And um, after that, after the bus got back, I got a whole bunch of business cards like Violator Management gave me business cards, PR, all these business cards. So I hit them all up when I got home. You got to remember, I'm still broke, no money. And um, nobody called me back. Three weeks go by. All of a sudden I get a call. Hey, do you remember us? You came to the 50 Cent launch. Yeah, we want to fly you out to Chicago. Can you do what you did on the bus in Chicago? I'm like, sure. So they fly me out to Chicago and I'm like 50 Cent's hype man and doing brand ambassador work, handing out energy drinks at this um, uh, uh, convention, right? I killed it. They were like, yo, would you like to work for us? Like, yeah, I need a job. I'm unemployed. So, um, and I got paid for that day and uh, they put me up in a hotel room. It was insane. Um, so then I had my first interview and I show up to the interview and the big boss is there. And he was like, okay, so what's up? And I'm like, what's up? And he's like, you don't have anything? And I'm like, oh, I thought this was an interview. So he's like, come back when you got something. What does he mean? What have you? What are you supposed to have here? I don't know. I, I guess I was supposed to have like a marketing plan or something. Okay. You know, and the big boss is not Fifty Cent. The big boss is the, 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 the head of the marketing campaign. The head of the startup. Okay. Fifty Cent is the brand ambassador investor, but um, Chris Clark is the guy running the place. So he says, "What do you got?" And you yeah. say, "Nothing." And he says, "Come back when you've got something." Yeah. Is, is it in a couple of hours or a couple of weeks? Or Days. Does that mean never? <laughs> okay. I, it felt like never. But I think they liked me, so they wanted to give me a real good shot. And I also think I was a diversity hire because <laughs> it's 50 cent and there's nobody in the office that's black. And they're like, we need somebody that understands this. So I went home and I didn't know New York City. So my homies, they're from Brooklyn. So I was like, I need you guys to tell me about Brooklyn so I can write this marketing plan. So I sit in the back of the car, we start smoking some weed and then just let the like creativity juices flow. And by the time we finished the, the blunt, an hour has passed and I have the full marketing plan, okay? At the same time, it's Zuccotti Park, Occupy Wall Street. So I went and grabbed content of, cause they gave me a bunch of gear. So I went down there, I got uh, Russell Simmons, I saw Lupe Fiasco, a whole bunch of different people down there and I was grabbing all this content and I threw that into my marketing plan. And I came back in the office and I, did my presentation and everybody's jaw just dropped like, oh, this is genius, right? All these different elements. And they're like, when can you start? And I'm like, I don't know how soon. They're like, can you start today? And it took me right to my desk right from there. And then um, I'll never forget the next marketing meeting. We were talking, whatever, whatever. And the lady's like, um, you know, asking me questions. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on. She's like, this is your marketing plan. I'm like, Oh, oh, my plan. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. I had no idea like this company was about to run with my entire marketing plan. Like that was their new thing. And I was the go to guy. So they were asking me questions about this. How should we do this? How should we do that? How should we do social media? All these different things. Um, and then it, it, my life changed. <laughs> how, how long did you do that for? Two years. All right. After that? Um, after that. And what, two years now, what are we in? Are we in 2016, give or take? Nah, this is er, earlier. 2014, okay. 2013. So you do that for a couple of years. Yeah. The product itself, uh, how did it, how did how did the energy drink end up? Um, didn't do too well. Um, I think we went too big too fast. In hindsight, with CPG, I think you have to take over a region. I think we tried to take over the country. What is CPG? Uh, consumer packaged goods. Okay. Yeah, I think because the marketing plan was national and it was just too hard for our small team to manage like all this. Like we had hundred something stores of 7-Eleven, uh, Dwayne Reed nationally. You couldn't manage all that. I think we should have took smaller chunks. Like let's just focus on the Northeast region and focus all our efforts there. Well, that, that I mean, and you're, you're tapping, you're trying to get into a market that's already dominated by five hour Monster, energy, five hour energy, Red Bull. I, what are the yeah. Other ones? Uh, 
the new one that I've just noticed on the market is Celsius, but okay. I don't know how I mean I don't know how many dozens come up and never get never get seen just because it's a it's a massively saturated market already. Yeah. And dominated by big players. Yeah, super difficult, right? Um but I learned a lot. It that was like my uh my university experience to learn marketing because um, I was directly connected with the C-level execs. And it was weird for me because I'm a kid here who I don't have a college background, but everybody around me is from Harvard and Yale and Princeton. Like literally all my colleagues are from Ivy League. And it was weird. The bosses would leave and all the Ivy League kids would come to me and ask for help to do their work. And that's when I started realizing, like, what what is this Ivy League thing? Like, because you're asking me, I didn't go to school. How come you don't know this stuff? And I started realizing, like, experience trumps all. Mm -hmm. Because I had done all this, you know, stuff from running my blog to being a, um, a performer. I saw so much of the world. It was really, really wild. Um, and um, so, yeah, so after that, so after the... Um, energy drink situation i did more cpg but i didn't like it i was like this is too slow um we need to move into mobile apps and every time i would talk to uh, a owner or an investor you know they'd be doing cpg like you know spirits or something like that i'm like yo you guys think about doing an app i always try to convince people to do an app and everyone was like no 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 this is what we do no this is what we do all right. So I just pivoted and then I went into the app world. And in my first job, at uh, my first interview in the app world, I bombed. I was just, I didn't, he asked me questions. I had no idea what he's talking about. I, yeah. And you mean app as in apps on a phone. And I still, I mean, I know people who have made apps and I still don't understand how they, I mean, I don't understand the programming part, let alone yeah. once you've got a functional app, get people. I mean, I knew someone who tried to design an app. They designed it. And then yeah. it's like, okay, we're launching now. Yeah. And then the idea, if it's it's like a video, if it doesn't get viral within the first week or two, it dies out and then technology moves on, ideas move on, and that entire investment uh, is dead in the water, so yeah. to speak. Yeah, yeah. So he, was, he asked me, I remember he asked me, he's like, are you familiar with ASO? I'm like, nah, what's that? He's like, app store optimization. It's all these different aspects of app store optimization. And it's basically how to get people to adopt your product from within the iPhone or Google Play stores. So I spent the next year devouring everything online growthhackers.com i don't even think it's there anymore inbound.org all the youtube videos tons of seo and then i started going back out there and interviewing and what i realized was oh, i could just run my own agency because i know how to do this now so i started running my own marketing agency technically i was already doing marketing agency with the cpg stuff i was always even with the 50 cent gig i was an independent contractor mm -hmm. i wasn't an employee um, so I just pivoted into mobile apps. So I started working with countries in France and all these different places, and I really enjoyed that. So I just been in tech ever since. Very cool. And now, um, when do you get into social media and when do you get into the viral video of the Starbucks that, that, so, that law, I mean, you had a presence before that video for anybody who doesn't know it's, it's the video. One day we'll have tech. I'll be able to line it up and we'll play the video beforehand, but is a licensing agency uh, handling that video? Yeah. Yeah, so I wouldn't play it anyhow. It would get claimed by the agency. <laughs> it's the video where uh, where Hotep goes into a Starbucks and um, exploits the gullibility, I should say, of people's propensity to believe that the trend is actually a real trend. And this was a, a satire parody of Hotep going in and saying, where's my free coffee? It's reparations coffee and I'm going to go get one. And the lady behind the counter, it's like, oh, I never heard of that. Here you go. Because nobody wants to be rude. Nobody wants to be impolite. Nobody wants to pretend that they're not with the current thing. Yeah. Were you, did you have a social media presence? Oh yeah. But before that. Okay. So yeah. I mean, I've had a social media presence since 94, 95. That's, like that's when the birth of the, end. I remember my first email address was 1996 roadrunner, Dave at Yahoo. Oh, I remember com. roadrunner. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so, Roadrunner was a service too. I believe. No, I didn't, I didn't have that. No, I just, I just, oh. people called me Roadrunner when I used to play squash. So that was my first email okay. address. Um, so yeah, like AOL, um, after AOL, we did Black Planet and Black Planet was really like where I really got my first shot at online marketing. So um, I started this page. It was too hot for BP, was naming the page. And basically I would just take verified attractive women and put them all on a page so other guys could surf what does verified attractive women mean um so sometimes you have accounts that are catfish but i would vet the girls and verify 
this is the girl you see which and made and it's consensual like they want to be on this website yes. i think it's not like facebook in the no. early days of rate you know comparing un you know unknown to the women no this was like linking people to each other okay right so these are accounts on black planet this is a place where it's mostly all black people and um you know so i was linking people so the, i you know reach out to the girls i would verify them i said would you like to be featured on this page yes i would okay great i can get you tons of hits i put them on there and then what i would do is i was um photo it wasn't photoshop it was macromedia fireworks at the time and i put banners for my page and my friends pages in between so anybody who came there would see it and it got so popular one day my friend called me up he's like yo i'm on this page too have a bp and i see your banner there i'm like yeah that's i run that that's mine he's like no way he's like yo everybody in my school is talking about this so it was really big so then it was my space and in my space, um, we had a really tight knit group and we started um, hitting the, the, the bulletin board. The bulletin board on my space was basically Twitter and nobody understood that. I did. So before there was Twitter, there was the bulletin board. And what I noticed was when you went on the bulletin board, if you hit that, you could basically dominate somebody's feed. So then I would have like 10 of my cronies we would all change our profile pic to the same thing and then we'd all hit the bulletin board. And then it just, everybody was like, again, another friend called me up. He's like, yo, did you hack MySpace? I'm like, nah, we just, you know, organic marketing. Um, and then Facebook kind of got popular, uh, but I didn't like it. I, I thought it was stupid. I never liked Facebook. Um, I tried it out, you know, even as an artist, they said you needed to have one. I went through the motions, but I never liked it. It was like so much pay to play. And I'm like, I want organic. And then um, that's when our homeboy Dwayne told me about Twitter. And this was 2009. Um, is it? Too? Yeah, 2009 Twitter started. Damn, I had a Twitter that long? I, th I think, you know, I, I look, I think I started in 2009, but really never used it until 2015. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to go back and see what my earliest tweets were, but. Yeah, yeah it's, it's been around for uh, Yeah, it's been around that long. Wow. Yeah. So 2009, I started my account and. Um, it was all for music at that time. And then when I had the blog, we had about seven writers on my blog and I would connect their accounts to WordPress. So every time a, a story went out, it would go out on all of our feeds at the same time. So again, they're creating this organic virality and um, we killed it. You know, that, that website was doing millions of hits a month and it was really big. And um, yeah, so I kind of just, I've been in social media forever, so I just kind of understand it. All right, now let's let so let's get to this video, which um, if it, it it puts you on other people's maps who who never heard of you. Yeah. Um, first things first. Now the interwebs. There was a website I think uh, we talked about it beforehand, which described you as a as a. I don't say they said black supremacist or <laughs> African supremacist. Okay. Um, and what this is going to get into all of the you know the Scott Adams stuff, but yeah. Uh, when you go into the Starbucks and you say, I want my reparations coffee, is this a troll? Is it, you know, a little bit of truth in jest? Is it to see what you can, how far you can push this thing? And what's the context in which you say, I'm going to make this video claiming reparations coffee and then post it to the interwebs? Yeah. So can we add a little texture to, Please. to this? So at one point I was like a super deep black nationalist. Um, and then, um, it was the summer of Mike Brown, Trayvon Martin. And um, I remember the verdict came down where um, George Zimmerman was found not guilty. And um, like I said, I was very much inside of black Twitter, not this new black Twitter. This new black Twitter is not black Twitter. So I was deep inside black Twitter and I saw the reactions and tears came to my eyes. I was brokenhearted. Like, damn, like I could really feel the pain of my people in this disappointment. Then I started tweeting about, I said, what do we do from here? And I'm like, we have to start coming up with solutions. So I started talking about, you know, basically black capitalism. And then they started like, I started getting attacked. I'm like, wait, what? I'm attacked like, attacked from what you call black Twitter. I don't want, I, I don't want to get in trouble on the interwebs. But yeah. I, yeah, so you're getting attacked by the, the followers that you've, uh, acquired it, in this domain of, of the Twitterverse. Basically, um, a new version of black Twitter was brewing that we had not known about 
that was being pushed by um, radical black feminists um, with uh, Marxism coming in the background later on. Um, and they started calling me Hotep. And I'm like, you can't be a Hotep. That it, it means like peace, right? Like you can't. And they kept calling me that. So I was like, all right, fine. I'm a Hotep, like whatever. What is, I, I looked it up. Uh, I didn't know what a Hotep was, but what is, what is a Hotep? What does Hotep mean? It's, it's So it's, it's ancient uh, Meduneta, which is the language of ancient Egypt. And basically it means to be at peace, to be at rest, uh, satisfaction. Um, the, hiero, the, the glyph is like a diamond with a line underneath it. That's how the glyph of Hotep is written. So there's like a lot of balance to it. But um, in the, what they call the black conscious community, you know, deeply rooted in Harlem, New York, you know, we set it as a greeting. You know, you say Hotep, you know, instead of saying peace, you would say Hotep. <clears throat> so because that's how we greeted each other, they called us Hoteps because it has, that's how we greeted each other in this black nationalist, you know, grouping. Um, so I was like, all right, fine, whatever. And then the whole Trump situation started coming about where Trump had announced he was going to run and he was running against Hillary. Now, you got to remember, I'm like super deep in the conspiracies and I know her background specifically with the black community. You know, I knew her background where she was taking incarcerated inmates and bringing them to her personal property. I'm like, this is modern day slavery right here. You know, uh, I knew about, um, you know, how the people in Haiti felt about her following the earthquake donation money. There was a whole bunch of conspiracy theories surrounding that. And I'm like, I'm definitely not rooting for this lady. And then I saw everybody rooting for her like black, you know, um, and I was like, what? Like, how? Like, you, no, Trump. And then um, I was a Trump guy. Uh, before Trump, however, prior elections. Before you, you elections. Vote, you're voting Democrats? Let's say I, you, you voted I, for Obama? I, I, I voted for Obama. Matter of fact, I went on Rutgers radio. They said, uh, are you going to vote for Obama? I said, yeah. They said, why? I said, because he's black. That's the first time around. That's the first Did time around. Did you vote around. from the second time around? No. <laughs> it's, like a, it's, it's an amazing thing. I, I want to know how many of the 81 million who voted for Biden, the 81 million who voted for Biden the first time around are going to vote for him the second time around, where you vote in hope and change, and then four years later, you've got division and yeah. uh, other stuff, to say the least. You voted for Joe Biden to build back better, and now we're you know building to WW3. Yeah. Um, so you voted for Obama the first time, not the second time. Yeah, I think I was like maybe 22 at the time, 23. I, I know. Hold on. Hold on. The second time around, mm -hmm. he ran against. Oh, my gosh. Who, do, who was the Republican candidate? The it wasn't time? Romney, was it? It wasn't. McCain. Was it? Well, let's let's see what the I, chat chat. Help us out here. I think it was who, McCain. Who was the Republican candidate? It was 20. Uh, 2008. Oh, my goodness. Oh, uh, Oh, it's okay. Well, the, the locals chat will get it in a second, but when it gets in there, yeah. so you don't vote, you don't vote from the second time. No. Um, and you know, the I, I knew nothing about politics. Ro is the, so the chat is saying Romney. Romney, Romney. Yes. Yeah, Romney. Yeah. I wouldn't have remembered that. Yeah. It, this is how, this is how <laughs> uh, out of, out of, I was not involved in any of this, but right. And you're, you're, you know, you're saying conspiracy theories for the things, you know, like what the Clinton foundation did in Haiti and, and they're not theories anymore. I think a lot of it is confirmed uh, outright horrible exploitation uh, there's issues of, there's questions of human trafficking you know all this stuff and you see and, and you know like you're you're a member of the black community i'm a member of the jewish community mm -hmm. for whatever the reason the the black community the jewish community vote 70 and 80 some odd percent respectively democrat yeah. and I, I don't know why yeah i don't know what the reflex is i don't know how to account for it but it's a phenomenon yeah and the ones that sort of say why are you doing that get called all sorts of names yeah so you're now 2016 and you say i'm not supporting hillary right and what's the what's the backlash or the response that you get from uh, oh yeah i got called all kinds of names you know i was basically now a traitor to my people <clears throat> and i'm like okay like you know, I, I've always been a rebel where like, if I know this is the right thing to do, I'm not changing because the room says you should change. Like, no, you guys are just gonna have to be idiots on your own. Um, so I was like, no, I'm rocking with Trump. You can call me all the names you want. I'm here. This is the right thing to do. 
I stood on it. In hindsight, is 2020. Now, a lot of those same people are like, yo, we owe Hotep Jesus an apology. A lot of people have said that um, because of how I was treated. But, you know, during that time period, um, I educated myself. I did a ton of research because I don't want to be out here LARPing. You know, like I remember people start tar- talking about like this 1984 and George Orwell and Orwellian. And I caught myself, you know, using the Orwellian term. And I'm like, I need to know about this. So I went and I read the Orwell works. I read all of them, you know, the papers, um, the 1984 animal farm, you know, animal farms, a short read. Um, so I did all that research. Then I started diving into, uh, the Russian revolution and, um, I found my passion in studying communism. I thought that was like super fascinating. And, um, then I dove into Walter Williams, Milton Friedman, Thomas Sowell, and um, I was basically in university for like the entire Trump administration. And um, just I just didn't want to be a guy out here like, you know, supporting something and not being able to back it up. So I started, you know, um, listening to the cast. I remember I told you I was like trying to find one of your videos. I'm like, who's the Jewish guy with the curly hair? Like, how do you even find this guy? <laughs> and you got Dershowitz. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, Peter. Um, Because you had put out a video and I couldn't find it again. And I was like, which, I which need was the this. Video? Well, uh, it was one of the car videos. Oh, I don't yeah, remember what it was. I just remember when you spoke, I was like, this guy knows what he's talking about. I can I can tell a bullshit then, when then I then I faked it. No, I'm saying I faked it well, <laughs> but no, it, it is because like every time you put out a video, you have to know not to make a, a, a mistake. Yeah. If you make a mistake, someone in the chat's going to find it in thirty seconds, in 30 and seconds. it's and it's up there forever, and you can't take it back. So yeah. it makes you absolutely neurotic. Yeah. Um, and so, so 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 Trump comes into power. Yeah. You're unabashedly uh, pro Trump. Yeah. Which is why the internet also calls you. Uh, I think they they, they didn't say alt right. I think they called you. Uh, no, I've been called alt right. That's amazing. Um, alt right for supporting someone who once upon a time was also Afro, a Democrat. I, Afrocentric alt right. Um, <laughs> people love these labels because it allows people to say, "I don't have to listen to a word he said." That's the Afrocenter of a supremacist alt right dude. Yeah. Um, okay, so you're in this world. Yeah. And then uh, this was the backdrop to the 2019. Well, when, when I haven't always been aware of these things. When did reparations? I remember it being discussed, and it was at one point as much of a, a, a fringe philosophy yeah. uh, as was uh, defund the police before then it became mainstream. And it's yeah. st- I've noticed the same trend. It starts off as not a joke, but rather like a far on the end of the spectrum theory that no one's going to believe, no one's going to buy into because yeah. it's too extreme, like defund the police. And then it becomes the mainstream talking point. Yeah. We're now in a position where we got Gavin Newsom talking about some form of reparations in California. When did reparations as a political... Uh, discussion become not so uh, absurd in American politics? Like recently, <laughs> I want to say probably within the last, like after Trump, probably, you know, uh, definitely post Black Lives Matter PSYOP, right? Because you got to remember Hold on, that, hold on. You said BLM PSYOP. Yeah. Please go well, on. Well, <laughs> actually, that's the first thing that got me canceled. Before Trump, I got canceled because I was calling out BLM. And people call me a traitor for that. Um, you know, I was like, yo, this is a front organization for the LGB- LGBT community. And um, I got canceled for that. Um, like my mentions were like slammed for one whole day. They just like canceled me. Explain what you mean there, a front for the LGBT movement. Because now yeah. I, I, we're going to work this into the recent Florida stuff of, you know, DeSantis with his don't say gay bill, which is actually just don't talk about sex with kids bill. Yeah. Um, DeSantis now with his canceling bl- a, a black history month when it's actually just don't teach queer theory in the context of black history month. Yeah. And I'm sitting there saying, what does queer theory even have to do with black history month? Right. Uh, so elaborate on what you mean by LGBTQ, so, by that being a front, yeah, uh, using so, BLM as a front. So, you know, when the BLM stuff started happening, uh, I was watching and I saw certain figures become prominent. One of them was DeRay McKesson. Who, who's DeRay McKesson? Uh, he's the dude with the blue vest. He's okay. he's kind of irrelevant now. Um, but back then he was like the go-to guy uh, for all black matters. Right. And um, I remember calling him out. Right. It's it kind of stupid, but. You know, they were treating him like he was some leader. I'm like, yo, the dude's just a journalist. 
Um, and I was talking about this guy named Darren Sills. Now, in Ferguson, Mike Brown, Darren Sills was the guy on the ground. Since then, he's been murdered. His, 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 his murder is a mystery. He was burned alive in his car. We just don't know what happened. But Darren Sills, a real black conservative man, and I don't mean conservative in the political sense, um, was calling out Black Lives Matter. And what he said was there were people coming into Ferguson receiving checks. And so Ferguson was the real big launch of Black Lives Matter, right? This is Mike Brown was murdered mm -hmm. and there was marching. This is the first time you'll see Antifa operatives come in. But at the time they weren't, we didn't use the term Antifa. He said, you know, he was, frankly, white boys came from out of state and started inciting a riot with the police. This is what he said, okay? Hindsight, we know that's Antifa now, right? Or operatives or whatever that is. Then he said his movement got co-opted by these BLM people. So they were coming in. DeRay McKesson was coming in. And he said he got all these checks coming in. And on record, he said he went up and smacked DeRay McKesson in his face, right? This is a real street dude. So um, I was on his side. You know, I was looking at it like that. And then so I was like, well, what is this Black Lives Matter thing? Because every time I said something, I noticed there was this BLM in everybody's bio. I'm like, what is it? So I went to the website. And when I went to the villages section, if you go on Wayback Machine and go on the villages section, you'll see it says mothers, parents, children. And I was like, wait parents you mean mothers fathers children i was like oh they remove men from this movement oh this is wild so i ran into youtube i reported on it got killed a lot of my base was like yo he's on to something but the marxist left killed me right started all types of rumors about me just anything just to silence me right um then I called out Sean King. This is before Sean King, as you guys know him. This is bef way before. Called him out. I, I'm not asking this to be glib. Sean King is is m mixed or white? I'm pretty sure he's white. Okay, and Sean King is, I mean, I know him from Twitter. Yeah. And he's uh, the spokesperson, or I say a spokesperson. <laughs> he's a vocal uh, a self-anointed uh, spokesperson for the black community, but yeah, and, and it wouldn't even make much of a difference. It's just that I don't know if, if the world deems him to be a, what was her name? Do Dolezal? Yeah. Uh, Dolezal. So we don't, it's unclear as to whether or not he's white mixed race or yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So you're calling him out, I'm calling him out on, on what basis for what reason? Just being a LARPer, just being like a shill, being a grifter. And a LARPer, for those who don't know, live action role playing. It means faking in real time. I didn't know what LARPing was until I saw people in the park at Mount Royal LARPing in the you know, yeah, medieval it's attire. just grifting, you know, like, and there's documentation of it. Like, there was an article, I want to say 2014, where something happened to this little black girl in Haiti, and then the donation money went missing. And then it happened again with Tamir Rice and Tamir Rice's mom is on like Instagram live or something like that saying she never got the money from Sean King. And but it's just like these stories keep popping up with Sean King. Then he worked at DeRay McKesson and then his own organization, Sean King's own organization canceled him because they're like, there's no checks and balances. There's no transparency. Where's the money going? And we saw that with BLM. Now we saw that. So I'm calling this out before I even had this information, really, because I can just I just saw it. I'm like, this is a fraud. This dude's a fraud. And that's a fraud. This is like I said, ascended master. Like I read people. That's my uh, natural ability. And so you see now the removing the father or the family from the BLM. Yeah. Uh, elaborate on that, because I think we talked about this on your channel, but I would let's I want to flesh this out in more detail. What 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 happened? Like what happened to the website? What do you think the rationale is for the change? Um, there wasn't. That's how it started. There was no change. It just said in the, in a the villages section, it said, you know, affirming the lives or something like that of mothers, parents, children. And I'm like, that's a deliberate omission of mm -hmm. black men. And then you look at the rest of the website and it's talking about like transgender people and gay people. And all. So then I ran to YouTube. And I'm like, yo, this is a front organization for LGBT. And this has nothing to do with black people. This has everything to do with the LGBT community. And I said on my video, I'm like, yo, it's cool if that's what you are. But don't call yourself Black Lives Matter. Call yourself, you know, LGBT Live Matters. 
I can get behind that, right? Like I want everybody's life to matter, but don't come out here and say, you know, you're for black people. Black men are being exploited by the media, altercations with the police, but then omit black men, knowing that we were the focal point of this whole movement and why you were even able to sprout. So I called that out and I got canceled, right? So then when Trump came around, I got double canceled, right? But common sense is common sense. You know, if, 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 if uh, you see smoke, it's probably fire. And I saw smoke. I saw a lot of smoke. This is what it is. So, you know, um, at that point, I was like, I'm fucking with white people. I can't I can't be bothered with y'all. Like, I really just like I wrote off the black community. Left black community. Right. Because I had no idea. Left and right existed until Trump came about and I started doing my studies. You got to remember, I knew nothing about politics. I was a black kid that did hip hop and I did mortgages. And that's all I knew it was marketing, mortgages and hip hop. I didn't know anything outside. I was just trying to get money. And I started learning about these things. And I'm like, oh, we're Democrats. <laughs> OK. Oh, like I didn't know a Democrat and a Republican. I didn't know what these things meant. I just knew that. Republican was supposed to be bad. And I remember in high school is one black kid said he was a Republican. And um, I remember looking at him like, wow, that's so cool. You're the only black Republican I know. <laughs> right. It's an amazing thing. I mean, we're, we're, we're probably going to get into this. It's like why, why blacks and Jews vote Democrat, but have conservative values, uh, you know, in, in, in the pure, in the truest sense of conservatism. And now you mentioned, you know, you knew one black conservative kid growing up and I'm thinking of what uh, Kamala Harris just said the other day, like, why are conserv why don't conservatives love the environment? Why are conservatives bad? Like that was a memory that she allegedly had as a child. Yeah. You're, so you're, you're discovering this now yeah. in, in real time. Yeah. I, and you say, I'm, I'm going to go fuck with white people. Yeah. Which, and now that means in the sense, like, I, like I, I'm done, I'm done sort of kicking the hive with, with, with the black side of Twitter. Now I'm going to go poke some fun at the, at the it, white side of Twitter. Or? It was, it was like, I had done everything I could do in black culture, right? I had reached the pinnacle of my success in hip hop. I didn't did the 50 cent thing. I, I you know, I, I retired from music. I had a viral album. I didn't need to do anything else as far as that was concerned. Um, but I was on a search for knowledge and I wasn't getting that from the black community. Um, mostly from the right wing black community, I got all of my African studies. And, you know, as far as that was concerned, I felt like I read everything I was interested in. Um, so I, I felt like my knowledge as far as African studies were concerned was peaked. And I'm like, I know nothing about this European world. I know nothing about these things of communism and socialism and, you know, European history, World War One, Two, Woodrow Wilson. I don't know anything about this stuff. I'm going to fuck with the white people. I need y'all to teach me. So I started crowdsourcing information like, yo, what should I read to learn about this? And then they just send me books and I would just devour books. You know what I mean? So I, I tapped into white people. And then because you got to remember, I just came from a black nationalist mindset where I'm only messing with black people. And then you kind of have this like epiphany where like that's stupid. Like you're like limiting yourself. Right. Like, you know, where is the ceiling in black culture right like the ceiling in black culture is like uh bt i guess getting a job at bt like that's the ceiling and that's really low for me you know what i mean otherwise you have to do it as an entertainer and i wasn't interested in being an entertainer i wanted to be an intellectual i wanted to be popular for my brain and what i thought especially now that i had twin boys i didn't want them to grow up and say I want to be like dad and be a rapper. I want to grow up and be like dad and be smart. So I just started, you know, going towards white people. And the more I started to learn them, because I knew nothing about white people. I stayed away from them. I avoided them at all costs. I started to love them. It's like, oh, these people are kind of cool. Y'all yeah, told me these people was racist. Like, like, no, there's some things going on here. So I started, you know, diving into and I'm still like trying to learn white culture. I still don't get it, um, but I'm, I'm starting to understand. But um, 
Then I learned about the conservative. And then I was like, oh, conservatives are basically niggers. <laughs> this is how I'm looking at it. Like, oh, y'all the black people of white people because you're outcasts. You're like, you're the minority treated as a minority. I'm pretty sure conservatives are the majority in this country. Um, but to answer your question, why do Jews and blacks vote mostly Democrat? And I think it's because we have poor representatives, right? Like the people that speak for us, the people that represent us are poor represent uh, representatives. Um, you know, we talk about black folks, like who am I supposed to look up to that's black? That's an intellectual, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Not anymore. <laughs> not, a, not after that interview with Patrick Ben David. Yeah. I mean, he's not for politics. Maybe for science. I, for I, science, maybe. I, yeah. I, 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 and it's not to say this is not the. He's not dissing him. No, right. I, I loved his science. I, his voice is also very mesmerizing. But yeah. setting that aside, I used to watch all the science stuff. But seeing how politics is the mind virus that actually just kills a good mind. Yeah. I mean, that that interview, it's with with um, Neil deGrasse on Patrick Bad David yeah. and then watching you know Malcolm Gladwell debate Matt Taibbi yeah politics turns a good mind to jello yeah but you say and it's interesting you say like who are the good representatives and I'm all thinking American politics and I can think you know like Adam Schiff um the one who people make the uh, the, the 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 penguin joke about Nadler Herb Nadler okay. I, mean, I can think of these politicians who are Jewish they don't represent Jewish people per se like they don't say here are my policies as a Jew. Yeah, uh, they raise the fact that the Jewish, when they get criticized and then claim anti-Semitism, Adam <laughs> Schiff, I'm looking at you. Uh, so it, it's true. Like these are these are, uh, I would say, below average intellect individuals who yeah. end up governing. Yes, but like it was Plato or Aristotle said, if you don't get involved in politics, you end up being governed by your inferiors. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I look at these. Yeah, now I can see it. We're, we're governed by idiots. Yeah, uh, at large. Yeah, for the most part. Yeah. But what is it? I, I, what is it culturally? In, in, and I've asked myself this question: it's like within the Jewish community, that we feel um, morally uh, better about ourselves, voting Democrat, voting liberal in Canada, yeah. when in reality it should be the exact opposite from what I've known. But well, what, what's, 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 I what mean, the conclusion have you come to? Well, Republicans just suck. They just suck at what they do. Right? They're like so hands off and complacent. They're like these are the states we got. We're cool with winning these states. We're not really trying to help nobody, right? Um, whereas Democrats are like, hey, we want to help everybody, right? Except well, for the red, right? It's it's the pro progressivism versus conservatives. And one is yeah. to conserve, in in a, in a ideological sense, conserve versus keep moving forward, yeah. which is why Democrats and liberals in Canada yeah. come off more like activists and conservatives yeah. and Republicans come off more like, we'll play by the rules and we'll be polite and, and hope to win that way. And... I, it's not clear that that's a even, even, uh, an even battle. No, it's not. Well, it's it's a one sided battle. The Republicans aren't even fighting; they're just like you know chilling. And then Democrats are doing all the work, right? Like for example, I remember I went to uh, a rally and uh, I was speaking to some gentleman, and he said, "You know the difference between um, a uh, Republican rally and a Democratic rally is uh, tech technology." You know, when you go to a Democrat uh, rally, there's laptops and, you know, all this drones and so much technology and content and, you know, working. And then when you go to uh, a conservative rally, it's just coffee mugs and, you know, your, your thermo thermos. Right. And I'm like, yo, that is so true. So like the Democrats are actively working and mostly because they skew younger. So they have a lot of youth and a lot of energy, whereas conservatives are skew a lot older. They don't have that energy and they're not as you know in tune with tech. So, you know, you'll get destroyed as far as like big tech. Big tech is all lefties because conservatives never, you know, uh, thought of it as valuable. You know, a lot of them like to go into blue collar work. And, and that's I think that's absolutely fantastic. Like I said, my dad was blue collar. But um, they just ignore a, a huge population of people and uh, not to say that they should placate to those people's needs. But when you don't, somebody else will. And that's the nature of the socialist is to exploit the minority and the struggles of the minority. So the socialists, they see you struggling, whether it's handicapped, gay, black, whatever, Jewish. Hey, look, you got a problem. We'll help you out. Go vote for me. You know, and then the funding comes and then they start paying off your leaders 
And then the next thing you know, your whole movement's co-opted and everybody's like, they see their favorite actress or favorite entertainer saying this is the way to go. You kind of want to follow suit. I'm thinking of John Legend and Pink and uh, Michael Phelps telling you to go get boosted because did you? Oh, who's the other one? Um, uh, he's on with Jimmy Fallon. Char- not not Charlemagne. Come on, the um, uh, the music guy. You're talking about oh uh, Questlove. Questlove, who I, uh, everyone <sighs> I've been blocked by. I've been blocked by Questlove. I've been blocked by Pink and Bro. who was the third? No, no. But I tell you, it's it, Bro. the leaders get co-opted, and Bro. it seems to be money. That's at the end of that. But hold on, hold on. Dude. We're, we're going to get to the viral video we at some stop, point. Here. we got to stop right there, though. <laughs> okay, tell me about Questlove, because I don't know enough about Questlove, except for that he blocked me. And- He's like a pioneer. He's like one of the goats of hip-hop. It, it, is, it, is, it is, like, actually upsetting. And I don't say <sighs> not because he's black. This is just because these are people's idols, white or black or whatever, now pushing this on people. Like, it hurts so Gene bad. Gene Simmons, uh, Rage Against the Machine, like... You li- you either die the hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Uh, so that that is a, that. I mean, I never cared about Pink, but it is ironic that Pink is now pushing the jab and blocking naysayers because Pfizer's taken over her social media account. I've met my favorite rapper before, and it ended ugly. Like one of my favorite rappers, he's, he's my enemy now, and I'm just like, how come I never knew this was happening? Yeah, who, I was, who said it? Who said it? Don't meet, be be careful before meeting your heroes. I don't want. I don't want to meet none of my. More, I don't want to meet any more of them. Trust me, and believe you. I do not want to meet any more of my heroes. If I see them, I'm gonna shake them, ask for autograph, and run. Um, and now I can't even have any because I'm so old. But you know, it's it's really heartbreaking to see Quest Love go hard left because the the long term outlook is detrimental to the black community. Uh, It's just brainwashing. And, you know, you look up to these guys and you think like this is an intelligent individual, you know, he's for black people, but exactly what he's doing is just like, you're promoting death. Like, you know how many family members I lost because they didn't take a hotep take to health because they wanted to get jabbed because they chose to go to the hospital. Like, here's another controversial take I had during the whole thing. I was like, yo, if you get COVID, don't go to the hospital. They're going to kill you in the hospital, bro. We're not on YouTube, right? It doesn't matter. I'll, I'll put, we're not right now. I should actually, my wife said, uh, Dave, are we supposed to be on YouTube? No, Marion, we're not supposed to be on YouTube, okay, but not good. for any other reason. I'm going to post this to YouTube, but I interviewed, um, geez, I forget which doctor it was who said, you know, in the early days when they were intubating, it was partly to treat you know the respiratory problem and also partly to recycle the uh infected person's breathing with the theory being that maybe it would be less likely to you know be, be contracted by people treating the person so they intubated as a protective measure for the for the doctors and nurses and other pe- and other staff yeah. when they knew at a given point it was actually killing people um i interviewed alex stein and apparently this they they intubated his mother despite I hope I'm not mixing up the actual details of the story, but Alex Stein, primetime 99, um, they, they administered a treatment to his mother that he, and I'm fairly certain it was intubation and it ended up killing her and, and, and devastated. So I, this is, you know, I mean, they co- killed, controversial once upon a time, they, but no more. They, they murdered Trump in the media. They said, oh, he's not getting these ventilators out. We need more ventilators. And I'm looking at the screen like the ventilators is what's killing everybody. Like if you ask anybody, Anybody in the medical industry about ventilators, usually ventilators are to keep somebody alive so family can see them before they pass. It's like that's like the last option. And you're taking, you know, healthy people and putting them on ventilators to help them breathe when the holistic method is aromatherapy. It's very simple. Um, But all the medical practices in the hospital, you know, most of it's trash. I would say 80 percent of it's trash. Uh, Western medicine is great. If you get shot, yes, give me Western medicine, uh, broken leg. You know, it's Western medicine, uh, as it was told to me, comes about from war. That's how it develops from war. So if it's wartime wounds, yes, go to the hospital. Right. But for some of these other illnesses, 
I'm like, yo, I don't know if I'm going to hospital for a cold or flu. I might not even go if I get cancer, bro. Like, I got holistic doctors, and if I get cancer, I'm not going to the hospital. They're without, you know, I, I wouldn't judge anybody for their beliefs. This, and I can understand, like, people say, like, okay, good. For treating traumatic injury, yeah. yes. Yeah. For preventative stuff, I mean, when, right. when, when you find out, and we now know definitively, like, you know, that certain treatments, which were non-invasive, uh, non-medication based, yeah. were not being uh, discussed. I yeah. mean, exercise, sunlight, vitamin D, none yeah. of these things were being discussed by the same people who were saying- it's anti-science. Go, go get a hamburger, go get french fries with the Blasio and get a jab and, and that'll, you'll be healthy. Well, let's, 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 let's go to basic science. We know that uh, white sugar can act as a carcinogen. We know that white sugar uh, can be uh, converted into fat in the body. We know that white sugar is a toxin, right? Um, but yet, when you go to the hospital, what do they give you? White sugar. They even give you high fructose corn syrup. You ever go to the hospital, you see some, go meet somebody else when they got these little um, containers of juice. They're like apple juice, orange oh, yeah. juice. Like that stuff's some concentrate. That's not real, right? Like, if you were going to give somebody fresh squeezed orange juice, that's vastly different from this little cup. So I'm saying this is someone who's legitimately sick and you're going to give them more poison. Here's another thing. If you want to boost your immune system in the short term, you fast. When you go to the hospital, they do. They feed you three times a day. When really to jumpstart the immune system, you fast. This is basic science. This is, in fact, when we talk about the hotel community or the black conscious community, you know, before we dive into like all that Afrocentric stuff, we talk about chemistry, science, biology, because we always say know thyself. And in order to know thyself or to know yourself, you got to know the human body. So we start our studies at science. We start with holistic healing. What kind of soap do you use, right? Because, you know, Johnson & Johnson got in trouble because black babies grew up with cancer because of the, the baby powder, all types of weird Johnson stuff. Johnson & Johnson, $2.2 billion in criminal and civil penalties. I think that was in 2013. Mm -hmm. Beaten by Pfizer, which was $2.3 billion in criminal civil penalties in 2009. <laughs> Those are two of the three top highest pharmaceutical criminal civil penalties. And lo and behold, two of the three companies making, making the, the jab. But coincidences, people, and we should trust them now. And if you don't trust them, you're a right-wing <laughs> conspiracy, conspiracy theorist. theorist. Right, yeah. Um, and by the way, also Hotep. Uh, New York Times says... Uh, don't go do your independent research, okay? Right. Sit down, shut up, and listen to what the experts tell you, the yeah. experts who have been lying to you for the last three years, but probably more. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, <laughs> what, 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 what do we even say after all of that? Yeah. I don't, you know, um, I, have, I just have a hands-off approach, man. Like, if you want to be an idiot and follow that stuff, I have no desire to change your mind. Go kill yourself. Fuck it. You know, I'm done worrying over things I can't change. I've done that for too long. It broke my heart knowing I couldn't help people. Now I just focus on people who are in the middle or who have questions. Yo, do this, don't do that. Do this, don't do that. You know, um, maybe check this out. But, you know, when it came to health, uh, like I said, this is something that we've studied. You know, we, we, we've, we, you, you can't even call yourself a hotep unless you... Like true hotep, you got to go do your studies on, you know, the carbon atom, right? Like that's where all this stuff starts from, right? Because we're carbon based beings, right? Um, uh, you know, they always talk about this molecule called melanin, right? And I'm one of those myth busters who's like, you know, white people have melanin too, right? Like, because people like to say, oh, black people have melanin. I'm like, you know, there's two types of melanin. There's you melanin and there's fail melanin. One is carbon dominant, one is sulfur dominant, but white people have melanin too. Well, we do get tan, which I believe releases some of y'all. You do. I got, well, I've got, I, I think one of my family members might have done the 23andMe thing. We only have like 1%, it's like less than 1% African, yeah. which still makes me more African than uh, Elizabeth Warren is native. But the, we're, we're uh, you know, Eastern European Jews who well, have if you're close, intermarried for 5,000 years. Well, yeah, if we're close to the Mediterranean, 
right? There's going to be that intermixing between Rome and Carthage, right? That's sort of how that admixture sort of happens. Um, but if you're one of those Nordic folk, yeah, you you definitely burning in the sun, right? You're not tanning, you're I had, getting red. I had an Irish friend growing up. He was very, well, he wasn't quite Nordic, but he was very sensitive to the sun yeah. and mosquito bites for some reason. I yeah. don't know what the connection there is. But it's still, his body has melanin. It's just a different type of melanin. So again, like when we dive into studies, like we really study and we're not just saying stuff you know, because melanin is technically just another marketing term. You know, it's just a conglomeration. I think it's uh, carbon, hydrogen, uh, oxygen, and another, uh, and maybe nitrogen in there somewhere. I can't remember. But it's it's carbon dominant in black folks and it's sulfur dominant in the Caucasian. But there's still melanin there. But anyway, the point I'm trying to make is if you study basic biology, you knew not to take the vaccine. If you study basic biology, you knew you didn't have to go to the hospital for COVID. I got COVID three times. First time I got it was before it was even announced. I didn't even know what it was. Uh, but was that the worst version? You Was that the worst uh, infection of the three that you had had or the most severe? I want to say the second one was worse. Um, yeah, I just wasn't treating my body right at that, that, at that point. I think I was drinking a lot of sodas and stuff like that. I was just being irresponsible, you know, all willy nilly. But... The first one I remember, I was at CES, and uh, oh, this I read about this one online. This is one of your conspiracy. This is one of the things that is attributed as a negative to you. Really, CES, and I think they said that you had previously blamed it on having been around many Asian, uh, people. Asian people. Yeah, I think they said Chinese, but I, th I yeah. So CES is the Consumer in, Electronics in, in Show Vegas. in Vegas. Yeah, bunch of Chinese people there. But I'm only saying this in hindsight because they said it came from the Wuhan lab Do in China. You know I'm going to tell you this, and I, I might get in trouble for this, but no, I, I've said this uh, a couple of times. Um, so I got, I don't know if it was COVID because it was the end of 2019, right into early 2020. Mm. Uh, and then where I went to um, Montreal's Chinatown with my kid, sorry, with my kid, this is the second one. We went to Chinatown. Um, this was right before it all happened. And we got, all got sick, like flu, coughing, deep cough. And in retrospect, I didn't even want to mention it because I, I don't want to get accused of it, it was politically incorrect where you can't even, you know, we couldn't even say where it, we thought it came from, let alone the fact that it was, you know, human tampered with coming from a lab in Wuhan, China. And I, you know, I just I, I remember the memory at the time and mm -hmm. being reluctant to even say where we got because I know we went out for lunch, got sick. Yeah. And then that becomes like it becomes politically charged. Yeah. Uh, to even make those connections. And now, you know. It, maybe it makes a little more sense in hindsight. Yeah. Um, so you're in. You're at the CES. This is in twi uh, early, late 2019, early 2020. I think it was 2020. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I just remember getting off the plane and um, where I baggage claim, and I was just like, "Yeah, I gotta sit down." And I was just like, no energy. I'm like, "What is wrong with me?" I'm like, "I've never felt like this before." So uh, you know, weeks later, I saw in the news this whole thing and i'm like oh that's what i had um and then when i got the second time um i was much different um but both times i i i just healed myself holistically right just, i just I'm, I'm still thinking about like it was what would be the problem conceptually to say oh this is a virus that originated in china yeah and now i was at an event and I think that's why I got sick. Like, where's the moral judgment in making that factual <laughs> hypothesis? Where does it become a moral judgment? It's like, okay, I think I got it from that person. <gasps> Can't say that. That's, that's racist. That's discriminatory. That's gonna. That's gonna cause hate. No, it isn't. Yeah. All right. Good. It originated in 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 China. Okay. Yeah. Maybe maybe that might actually help. You know, you deal with the contagion as opposed to killing yourself through political correctness. Mm -hmm. You got in trouble for that. I remember that was on one of yeah. the one of them websites that said. Uh, but they don't they don't cover like the good stuff we said. I remember I had Sister Samaya on my platform early 2020, late 2019. And um, her, Dr. Shiva, there was a bill in, in New Jersey getting passed or trying to be passed that was removing uh, religious exemption for the vaccine. And I just thought that was real eerie that right before they want to push a vaccine that it's now removing religious exemption, you know, taking away, you know, my body, my choice. I thought that was real funny, real, real funny, man. So, um, you, you say that I, people don't need to be proven good. I think people need to be proven bad. And if someone's going to make some accusations, they better have some like 
yeah some good evidence to write someone off I, you know you can not trust people with no more than you can allow them to steal from you yeah but if you i don't think people need to be proven good so i don't even think you don't have to come out into the world and say i've done good things i think if people are going to call you names they better come up with hard evidence of things that you've done that are bad i've looked into your scandals yeah. other than espousing what people call conspiracy theories in terms of what you know your understanding your hypotheses of, of black history yeah um Okay, are people not allowed having views yeah. that someone might disagree with, even if it's questioning the dogma or the um, you know the, the orthodoxy of history? Yeah, but hold on. we're going to get to the we're going to get to the video of Starbucks and all okay. of this. My yeah, goodness. let's yeah we, not, we never did that. This is going to segue into the, you know the, the, the Scott Adams stuff. Yeah, so um, the video. So all of this now, by the way. So this yeah. is the backdrop. Everybody, you now know Hotep. Yeah, and if you didn't know him, go watch the video. Like pause and come back if you're watching this later. You go to Starbucks. Yeah. But what is it like? What's so, your position right, so, on the reparations so, so, now? So, as- okay. So we have all the background <laughs> backdrop, right? And this is why this is important because now I'm aware of the left, right paradigm. So I said the week before the stunt, I went on YouTube and I said, guys, if you follow a liberal narrative, they'll propel a black man into the mainstream media. Just lo and behold, the Starbucks story hit where two black guys go into Starbucks. There's some racial profiling and it's national news. So I'm like, I'm thinking in my head, like, I should just go into Starbucks and ask for some reparations coffee. The idea just came. I didn't think about it. It just it, it just imbued upon me. It came from the ether. And but I'm not like a super grifter. I'm a mild grifter. So uh, I'm like, I'm not leaving my house to go do this stunt. It's just not going to happen. It's just whatever. Um, and then it was Saturday and, you know, the family said, um, you know, my lady said, y'all want to go to the mall. And I never go to the mall. But, you know, this time I was like, all right, I'll go. I'll go. And we go to the mall and I look up. We had stopped, you know, after Auntie Anne's or whatever. And I saw a Starbucks sign. And I'm like, oh. So I grabbed my phone. I went live. Was it, oh, you did go live. I went <laughs> live on, on, on Periscope. Okay. Oh, per- Twitter, that, Twitter is that, Live. Is that still around, Periscope? It's Twitter Live. Okay. But Periscope, the app is gone now. Um, so I went Twitter Live. And uh, it was a joke, right? I was just trolling. But I went, I went in there pretending to be serious. And I said, yo, you know, I heard Starbucks is racist. I need a free cup of coffee for reparations. <laughs> and the girl was like, right away, you know. And she got my free cup. And then um, I remember it. That was a Saturday. Monday came around. Tuesday came around. There's 100,000 views on the video on Twitter. And my boy Mike hit me up. He's like, yo, it's kind of suspicious that you haven't gone viral yet. And I'm like, yeah, I noticed that too. Wednesday hit. Everywhere. Left media thought I was one of them. Yep. It, it, I'm going to stop you there because it's interesting what you said that the left media will, pro- will leftist Democrats, liberals will propel a minority. Yeah. So long as they actually sincerely believe that they are towing the line, pushing the narrative. Correct. The irony in that is um, it's typically the left. And I mean, I'm, I compare this to Canada, the left, the liberals, Democrats who accuse the conservative Republicans of exploiting minorities, having their token Jew, their token black. When it's I, my long running theory is. Con- pure confession through projection you know the gobels accuse your enemy of doing what you're doing so as to create confusion so you say i'm going to go out here i know in my in my predictive modeling of liberal behavior if they think i'm sincere and they can use me to promote their agenda they will and i'll go viral yeah. and you get there yeah. you get a nice polite uh you know there's no faulting her she's just she's she's either naive or she just you know avoid a conflict what does a cup of coffee cost at a starbucks you pay five bucks for it it costs 15 cents at that and she's like oh i didn't hear about that here you go would you like a little spritz of uh, syrup in it mm-hmm. and um are you are you, you were not expecting confrontation you you knew one way or the other either it was going to be a rude here you go or it was going to be an apologetic here you go nobody was saying no to you i was in the moment so i wasn't even wondering what the expectation would be i had no expectations i was just i saw the starbucks sign and it was just go you know in the moment again like when you're a performer you don't think about you know is the audience going to like me or not you just go and do your thing and make them like you right so i went into starbucks and I made her give me the coffee, you know, just by my presence or whatever, you know, I did. And so it, when it when it pops and goes viral, you mm-hmm. start getting calls from media to come on, like. So um. And then what happens once they realize that? So you, you pulled a fast one on them. They 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 found out really fast, um, because 
you know, just a cursory look at my Twitter mm-hmm. timeline, you see Trump stuff there and they're like, oh, he's not one of us. So um, Jesus and Mero, I got picked up on Jesus and Mero and maybe like a couple of other news outlets, but right wing media figured it out. And in fact, Alex Jones did a story on me. But Alex Jones thought I was a lefty. So he was like cussing me out. Da, 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 da. And, um, you know, really like massive libel or whatever. And then um, when he found out it was a troll, he invited me on. He's like, Hotep, you totally fooled me. This is one of, this is one of the sound drops on your channel, which is Hotep, Je- Hotep, it says, Hotep, Hotep Je- Je- Jesus is a genius. Yeah, he's a genius. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I uh, so I went and did uh, Infowars, and I spoke to Alex, and me and Alex are like, you know, I text Alex, that's like one of the homies, and you know, uh, I was never mad at him for what he did because he just fell for my. You can't be mad at somebody for falling well, for your trick. It's sort of like in a way, and it depends on how they respond. Because I even I imagine, even in his well, actually, I, I, I would like to see how he responded at the time. But like when when Joe Rogan got a number of us got duped by the fake tweet from a doctor who says. Even if the even if the jab turned out to be pure poison, I would take it again because I'm I've got love in my heart. And it was, look, it was similar in spirit, but not in in in, in, dra- in the, yeah. the original tweet. And a number of people thought it had to have been real. She locked her accounts and yada. Nobody likes getting duped, but you know, even when Rogan got duped, I, he was still somewhat understanding and sympathetic to people who might actually think like that. Yeah. But so, so Jones finds out he got duped. Yeah. Calls you on and says. Uh, well played, sir. And, yeah. uh, and and then what happened after that? I you know I told him I like y'all been a big fan of yours for a really long time. Like, so if I got on Twitter in two thousand and nine, I've been watching Infowars at least since two thousand and eleven. I mean, I was posting Infowars links, and people used to be like, "Oh my god!" You in two thousand eleven, people were like, "Oh, they're fake news." They didn't use the term fake news, but no, they I, were, I, I, look all that I ever knew of Alex Jones before twenty eighteen was that he's a he's a you know, uh, nutcase conspiracy theorist. Yeah. And and, and nobody took me serious when I posted his links, but I'm like, no, it's no, some dude, good information you know, here. The, the meme Alex Jones was right is if we if we compare, if we just have a, you know, predictions versus come to true come to fruition or reporting versus reality. Yeah. Uh, for God's sake, I mean I I I I've been ex- I've been exponentially more accurate than MSM. He's been even better. And if and if being wrong makes you a conspiracy theorist, CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, they're all the 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 the, the epitome of conspiracy theorists. Yeah. So you're following Jones, which makes you public enemy number one. Okay. Yeah. Me- the left wing media finds out that it was a troll. They they drop the story sort of, or they start doing damage control and <laughs> calling you a, a provocateur. Yeah. Uh, uh, what's her name? Miss um, Graham over at Fox. Uh, Laura. Uh, Laura Ingram. Laura Ingram. Laura Ingram. I went and did Laura Ingram. And then um, later on, Rogan. And yeah, it's just been really dope since. And so then since then, you've been doing what you've been doing. Yeah. uh, Which is thought provoking uh, interviews with people. Yeah. uh, Long format, open ended. Yeah. uh, Killing it. I mean, doing amazingly well and, and, and not amazingly well in any I have no idea about your finances in terms of influence, in terms of reach, in terms of impact on this earth. Yeah. Um, I, I I was even reading into some of the purported conspiracy theories where you have one infamous conspiracy theory that the slave trade that we're taught uh, was entirely from Africa. Might You have a theory that African, African well, I guess they're not African Americans, but Africans were down south and that the slave trade was uh, from South America, not from Africa. At the mm-hmm. time, you take some flack for that, but... Mm-hmm. Like other than it maybe being an opinion that mm. other people might not share of of, of history, yeah, it's, uh, there there might be some actual potential historical basis to some of it. Yeah, I mean, uh, you can just go to a primary source, um, Cristobal Colon, aka Christopher Columbus, in his letter to uh, D. Saint Angel, he talks about um, the black natives in um, in the Caribbean, and he said they have uh, boats the size of an 18 oared galley and they traverse the waters really well. So just using like little stuff like that, you know, for example, do you remember, um, Elian Gonzalez? Remember would imply I think that it was I Elian Gonzalez. The first <laughs> um, so it was this kid who left Cuba. He was like a refugee left Cuba. Oh, and I th- well, I actually do think I know that story so, and survived the traverse on a dinghy of sorts. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I, not by name, but I remember the story for, 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 as a child. Yeah. So, you know, I'm just connecting pieces. So I'm like, if this child can get from Cuba to Florida on this dinghy by himself, obviously these 
black natives of the Caribbean could have gotten to Florida. And we know that the Seminoles uh, of Florida are a black tribe, right? So there is a black tribal native presence in America, right? So then the question then becomes, are the black Americans here African or are they the true natives or are they a mixture? Now, the one thing people always going to do is they're going to look at the phenotype. And you always hear people say, you're not African. You don't look African. Oh, uh oh, uh oh. So then what am I? Right. <laughs> I don't look West African. I definitely don't look West African. I don't look like a Nigerian. I don't look like a Ghanaian. I look more East African, if anything. Right. So is this the empire of Ethiopia? Because at one point, the southern part of the Atlantic Ocean is called the Ethiopian Sea or the Ethiopian Sea. So obviously the Ethiopics were traversing the seas, if it got named after them. Um, then, then, So then you go to the other side of America and you go to Hawaii. And Hawaii, you have this king, king called uh, King Kamehameha. And I believe that's where Dragon Ball Z got their thing from. This is a black king 1881 or something like that so the natives in uh hawaii are an admixture between um asians and um black people i guess negroid i don't know whatever the term is right so the the, the thing is you know they're talking about um uh, they came over i think it's called the Barren strait uh, uh the asians the mongols whatever whatever and I do believe that there is a Mongol presence in America, but I also believe there was a black or African presence in America, too. And I believe the two definitely had some sort of admixture. But I believe that there's more to the story than just saying black people came from Africa. It just, you know, also looking at primary sources, Christopher Columbus doesn't talk about bringing slaves to America. He talks about taking slaves from South America and taking them back to Spain. So, like, why isn't the 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 slave trade discussed from west to east? It's always discussed from east to west. So now we know that there were black people in South America. Brazilian has the second largest population of black people in the world next to the African continent. So that landmass is connected to North America. You're telling me nobody took that walk? You know, just little common sense like that. Um, and then there's other like documentation and books, but just using common sense is like, yes, there was a black presence in America. And even like, look, I, I, I studied Eastern European history and don't remember anything of it. And I just, I, I just did a little, I won't call it even fact checking, just to try to understand what your position was and what the objection was. Yeah. And it seems that even, even by ways of the objection, it's not that it's totally untenable. It's just that the majority or the, the argument just becomes one of numbers. Okay, yeah. there, there was some, there was some history, there were some uh, down south, but the numbers are. And so right. don't don't question the numbers. And, 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 and if you do, you become a conspiracy theorist. Yeah, yeah. But um, I mean, there's a bunch of people that came here. Um, Leif Erikson, Eric the Red, like came over um, out of the Mali Empire and the Songhai Empire, uh, Abu Kari, he literally in his work, he said, yo, I'm leaving. Y'all can have his, uh, you can have my throne. Uh, I'm going to check out this land to the east. I mean, to, uh, to the west. It's literally in the, you know, African history. You know, you learn this, like, like I said, you know, I think the, the, the real issue here, the real sin is that uh, world history actually isn't taught. World history is technically European history. Um, we don't have a real grasp of Asian history. We don't have a real grasp of even European history. Um, and we don't have a real grasp of African history. You know, I always test people. I say, name, name an African empire. People can't do it. You know, name an African king or queen. Like people can't do it. It's omitted. So when you go and you do the research, you start seeing things there that, frankly to people just sounds bogus but it's just you know uh dr john henry clark says you know every time you talk you're just telling me what you haven't read <laughs> you know so that's how i feel when people call me conspiracy theorists i'm like no you're just telling me what you haven't read 
And then they, uh, okay, good. We're back. Oh, hold on. I just want to make sure. I'm not looking at the time. I'm looking to make sure that we're still good. Yeah. We are. Um, and then, you know, you have uh, people trying to jam in queer theory in Black History Month. Yeah. When, um, I mean, let's get into actually how you got to Scott Adams after the incident. Now, for yeah. anybody who doesn't know what happened with Scott Adams is he did a, he did one of his dry humor, satirical you know, uh, parody type re responses to a Rasmussen poll, which said 23% of black, it was give or take 20 some odd percent of black Americans said it, they do not feel it's uh, okay to say it's okay to be white. 20% mm -hmm. weren't sure. And so Scott Adams said, that's nearly half of black Americans that don't feel comfortable around white people. Yeah. My advice, stay the F away from black people. Yeah. Um, it's uh, for anybody who's known Scott, you would have known it was one of his shticks, one of his bits. Yeah. Some people are going to say ill-advised, but it's, it's quite clear. Yeah. Some people who want to, you know, hold uh, his feet to the fire a little harder are going to say, well, he then relayed that into his own personal life experience, having helped and tried to help the black community, yeah. not feeling that that help was appreciated. So I'm just giving up and, you know, can't educate, let them live on their own and I'll stay where I am in my white neighborhood. Yeah. But quoted a Don Lemon statement, which the irony was palpable to anybody who knew what he was saying. But he took, I mean, it, it exploded yeah. um, in, in a meaningful sense. They pulled his comic from syndication. Mm -hmm. Publishers pulled his book or, 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 or canceled their contract with his book. Yeah. Um, I don't think he cares, really. I, I, I presume he's got, you know, hopefully he's got the, not FU money, but now survival money. But yeah. he's, he's taken the flack for it. He ended up, you ended up doing an interview with him. Yeah. Um, which even on YouTube, the last time I checked, it was at a couple hundred thousand views and it was a long format interview and that's yeah. just amazing. Yeah. Uh, how did you reach out to him? And I, bottom line, what's your position on what Scott Adams said? Well, I, I, there's three groups of people. Uh, one group is the people that know Scott Adams' work. Uh, there's a group, and the other group is bifurcated, um, who aren't familiar, is bifurcated into ignorant and disingenuous, right? So, Ignorant is somebody who is, as the word says, just completely ignorant of the facts of life, period, right? So they wouldn't be able to see past whatever they were conditioned to believe. Then are the people that know the truth, but they're disingenuous and say, oh, we can use this for our agenda, right? Um, me being one of those people, uh, you know, I want to put my, myself in the shoes of somebody who doesn't know Scott Adams and his work. And if I saw that clip, uh, uh, you know, several reactions I think I would have, it would probably be, oh, some white dude sounds something, scroll, <laughs> I don't care, right? Um, or I'd be like, ah, he probably didn't mean that, but, or, you know, or, I, I, well, what I'm saying is I'd have to do more research on it. Like, I wouldn't believe at face value some dude got on YouTube and said what he said. I would need to see, like, some KKK membership documentation to believe he was serious, right? Like, it, 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 like I, that's how I would look at the situation. I would not take for face value. I saw what I saw because it was so outlandish what he said. It was so hyperbolic. It was so triggering that, and again, like the people call me a provocateur so I can spot these things. Now I'm familiar with Scott's work. So when I first saw the video, I'm like, oh, this is this is great. This is this is amazing work here. This is like Oscar level work. This is like you people write books about this type of stuff. You know, again, me, I study human behavior. I wrote a book called um, The Unbreakable Rules of Masculinity, um, and it's been included in um, college curriculum courses under um, sociology and psychology. I know psychology very well um from human experience right not from university just to be clear so when i saw the sky adams thing i'm like i know what he's doing here i know the reaction this is amazing so i said as soon as i saw the clip i said i'm doing a video on this tomorrow i got to i got to so i wrote down a bunch of notes and then i watched it again uh, live on stream doing a live reaction and i cracked up laughing it was hilarious. I just thought it was brilliant. I thought it was absolutely funny. I thought it was just like, you know, like there's no way we're going to take this serious. I know he's trolling um, because, you know, because I know his work, I know he's trolling. You know, it's just like, 
Nobody in their right mind would say that. Like a guy like Scott Adams just wouldn't say that seriously unless he fell down and bumped his head, right? Well, I, I see the, the whole, the whole, uh, what's the word? Inception irony mm. is that he's highlighting how racist the question was. And if, and yes. if anybody believes the results to that question, here's what you would, the, how you would you have to do. Yes. And the Rasmussen, I mean, it, the Rasmussen question itself was so divisive yeah. and so provocative in, in a destructive way. Right. And Scott comes out and He's says, just playing I'm along. taking the bait. Look, let's just take the bait. What would you do now? Yeah. Um, okay. So that's, and then, and then. So I did the reaction video, right? Yeah. So um, in the reaction video, again, bifurcated, I said, first of all, just to be clear, I believe he's trolling. That's what I said at the beginning of my video. But assuming he's not, let's analyze this video. So I did that. And then I told my audience, I said, tell Scott Adams, I want him on my channel. I want to talk to him about this. And then um, yeah, word got back to him. Well, you got to remember, I I, um, I interviewed Scott Adams before. Um, he's been really great to me. So uh, it was no stranger to me already. And uh, so he hit me in a DM. He's like, yo, I heard you want to talk. Like, yeah, hell yeah. This is this is the topics I love. I love the race conversation because I know how guarded it is. Yeah, it's it's I mean, I'm Canadian Our, uh, you know, we're less diverse, say less diverse of a country than, than the States. We don't have the history or the present of the 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 racial discussion that goes on in the States that dominates and that silences and that is like walking on eggshells whenever whenever the the, the 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 conversation comes up yeah that used to be more true than it is now we have a divider in chief trudeau who wants to make race religion sexual orientation uh, all divisive issues so that people don't look at people as people they look at them as token ethnic identities or religious identities right but it's it's crazy in the states like you, you, you say the wrong thing inadvertently you're gonna wake up to a mob yeah uh, you say something that someone thinks is insensitive you're gonna wake up to a mob yeah um uh, well, actually, we're going to get to why that started and what you think the solution is. But uh, sorry, I interrupted him. Yeah. So Scott says he's coming on, and 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 now you want to explore what he said. On the one hand, it's either deliberately a troll or if he was serious. Dot dot dot. Well, you know, my motive for um, what for Scott was, I knew the video would get a lot of eyes on it, and I wanted people to see. Uh, a good conversation on race because we're not allowed to have them. Um, I wanted people to see that. Um, Cause for example, if somebody else like from the black left were to do that, they'd be like, I think they would have the conversation a very, um, um, it, it would be not open-minded at all. Right. It just like what you said is wrong and I'm going to keep interrogating you until you admit that you are wrong. There's no like room for middle ground. Um, again, um, I'm an autodidact. So when I look at the work of Marcus Garvey, Marcus Garvey, uh, uh, you familiar with Garvey? No. Uh, so Marcus Mosiah Garvey, uh, a prominent black leader, started the UNIA. This is around the time of W.E.B. Du Bois. You familiar with him? OK, so W.E.B. Du Bois is uh that name sounds more familiar but i i could yeah, pretend to, to yeah to be you're canadian enough. so you probably wouldn't um so w.e.b dubois is basically a black leftist uh based upon today's standard and garvey would be considered a black conservative based upon today's standards but obviously those times are different we're talking about 1913 ish maybe um so yeah, he starts UNIA, comes from Jamaica, and he's starting like this Pan African movement. He starts, uh, you know, he starts his company called Black Star Line, and he's talking to racists like KKK and the racists like we want black people to go back to Africa, and he's like I do too, <laughs> you know. So he starts his Black Star Line, trying to ship black people from America back to Africa. Like yo, let the white man have his land, we going back to Africa. Um, big entrepreneur W.E.B. Du Bois snitches on him with the w -A w uh, NAACP gets him extradited thrown in jail all this stuff whatever whatever anyway the point is Marcus Mosiah Garvey prominent black leader I look up to sat down with the KKK struck a deal KKK invested in his business how do you get the KKK to invest in a black man's business? Well, as we know, all humans operate off of self-interest. So 
if you if we know that everybody has that commonality, let's start there, right? The first thing we have to do is sit down at the table. They don't want us to sit down at the table. The second thing we have to do is say, what do you want? What is your self-interest? The problem is if we were to sit down with a white person and then ask the white person, what do you want? And if that white person said, I want greatness for white people, emotions enter the conversation. Oh my God, how could you say such a thing? This, this is racist, the history of racism. And you know, all this pops up. I don't think like that. I'm supposed to because I'm black and because that's how our programming trained us to be. But I'm some sort of sellout because I don't think like that anymore. But I'm looking at it as a grown man. How did a kingdom versus kingdom operate? Imagine you have your empire and another group has their empire and the empire goes, hey, I want good for my people. And you go, oh, my God, how could you? You look like a bitch. They're going to invade and going to kick your sorry ass. So I think of things in a masculine manner. I'm not looking at it from a race manner. I'm looking at it from a man. How would a man handle this situation? And a man would go, oh, you want good for white people? Sounds great to me. I want good for all people. We don't have to agree on that. What does this look like for you now? What does this greatness for white people look? Do you want to harm my people? No, we don't. Okay, then that's good. Then, uh, then how can we help? <laughs> right? These are the conversations we're frankly not allowed to have. Why? Because it renders the powers that be obsolete, impotent, Democrats no longer needed because they want to be the arbiters of race. They, they need the race conversation to be inflamed. If we extinguish those flames, they got no energy to run off of. They run out of gas. That's it. The party's done. It's over. And, and I'm here to extinguish those flames. And I saw Sky Adams as an opportunity to do that because really he, he stoked the flames <laughs> and I wanted to help extinguish them. Um, but I, st I, I know he stoked the flames, but I still feel like it was brilliant. I think I think sometimes sometimes you got to go backwards to go forward. Right. So so I, I, I thought I thought all in all what he did was productive. And, um, you know, like today I saw, uh, you know, I got uh, tagged in a comment on Instagram, some popular account where, you know, uh, black media, black gossip media posted the Scott Adams clip. And then somebody was tagging me like, yeah, here's that sellout right here that interviewed him. Right. So I'm going to I'm going to get that stuff. But it's just like Garvey got that. Um, Malcolm X got that like X X was Hotep X was an outcast Malcolm X wasn't celebrated until recently the black community did not like Malcolm X he was a radical he was saying things like you know it was the complete contradiction of MLK and what the NAACP was pushing and mm -hmm. where Adam Clayton Powell was going I know he didn't have nice things to say about the liberal white man but from <laughs> that, um, which might explain uh, unfortunately the, 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 the his demise at the hands of you know when the powers that be determine that someone is now too vocal and too powerful yeah um the so, so I mean what, look I listened to what Scott Adams said he, he was predicating it off the Rasmussen question, which was based on race. I said the only, the only, the only area where Scott was wrong was in running with the racial narrative and not with the economic narrative. Because at the end of the day, it, the, the distinction that Rasmussen was drawing on race is one of economics at large, where people say, look, if all things being equal, would you rather be within your own community? Most people are going to say yes. Mm -hmm. All things being equal, would you rather live in a a better off community versus a worse off community. Everyone's going to say, you know, the answer to those two questions are obvious. Then the question just becomes historically, um, there's a plenty of uh, white neighborhoods where I'm sure Scott Adams would not live. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. And like, I, I think there's a couple to, I won't live in in Delaware. <laughs> no, I, I go, I, my wife and I used to go road trip camping and like we pulled up at a number of campgrounds nothing but white people and we're like okay well we're I, even we don't we, we don't feel comfortable here and it has nothing to do with race it actually has nothing to do with it, it's class it, it, it's it's economics and then economics yeah like in harold and kumar i think i mentioned this on your channel but mm -hmm. harold and kumar when harold and kumar are walking around and they see a scary guy in the inner city and then kumar says to harold kumar's indian harold's agent says 
don't be racist. He's like, I'm not scared of the guy because he's black. I'm scared of the guy because he's scary. <laughs> and this is the reality is Scott was running with the racial narrative just because it was baked into the question. But the yeah. reality is everybody wants good neighborhoods and all things being equal, people feel better, more comfortable in their community. Some do. Some people like the adversity. And, um, but you can't have that. Dis- what I found is you can't even have you can't separate the discussion that way, because by breaking it away from the underlying racial presuppositions, you become racist. You yeah. become the privileged white person who says, I get to see things non-racially. Yeah. Um, but then it's a, it's that flow chart. And this is where racial relations in the States have come to. I don't know who made the flow chart. It says, if you see color, you're racist. If you don't see color, you're racist. Um, <laughs> how, how do you get out of the world where all roads lead to racism, even if the road is not a racist road? Yeah, so I, I I hate using everybody else's definition of racism. So I use my my definition of racism, and my definition is basically uh, if you care about your race of people, you know. So if you're if you're Indian and you care about Indian people, you're a racist. If you're black and you care about black people, you're a racist because you're basing your ideology based upon your race of people. I look at it scientifically. I don't look at it emotionally. And that's what Democrats do. They take this term that is a scientific term, race, which deals with biology and history. So it's the science we're talking about here. And then they add emotion to it where, you know, black people are allowed to be pro-black. But if white people are pro-white, you know, then it's a problem. And you got to subdivide it. White people can be pro Let's just take the one of the day. You can be pro-Ukrainian, which is, uh, it's a subdivision of white. That's yeah. okay. Yeah. Be pro-white at large. That's that's Nazi or that's nationalism. Yeah. Uh, you can be, uh, you know, uh, proud of your Jewish faith. Yeah. Uh, Italian. Italian. Mm-hmm. I, you know, uh, a St. Patrick's Day. Yeah. But uh, we, all lives matter at large, racist. It's a very, it's a very, it, it is divide and conquer in my, in my humble view, but very, so you, you, seeing racism non uh, emotionally, non-judgmentally. So yeah. there are races. There's distinctions. Yeah, and then, and but but it's 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 hard because there is so much history of white on black violence in America that I understand why people fear that because of just the many you know uh, attacks on the black population. Um, public lynchings, um, you know, the control of government, uh, Woodrow Wilson playing birth of a nation in the white house, right? Uh, world war one, black people weren't allowed to fight in that war. You know, there's, there is history that supports this, but we're not there anymore as a country is, is, is how I'm seeing it. So you can't like, for example, when something happens to the black community, what do they do? They go march. I feel like that's an antiquated thing to do. It's outdated. That's what you did in the fifties, because you that's you know it worked in the fifties. It's two thousands. There's better ways to solve our problems to uplift us, you know, because of the internet, because of the advancement of money, you know, venture capital. Um, we have more black millionaires now than ever before because of the NFL, because of the NBA, because of hip hop, rock and roll. We can do for ourselves. So the approach isn't the same as Jim Crow. We're not in Jim Crow no more. That white man is gone. This is a different white man we're dealing with now. This new white man is your ally. And he's a Democrat and he's stabbing you in the back because what he's afraid of, he's afraid that you're going to take those dollars from the NFL, the NBA and hip hop, create your mutual aid societies and you won't need him anymore. So in order to stop that, he has to give you social programs. He's going to give your people to social programs. You're not going to give your people to social program. The white Liberals going to give your people to social programs and they're going to have a dependency. So this is the evolution of racism where the evolution of racism has gone from. Don't give black people anything to wait. 
we should give them anything. They'll be dependent on us. Now we rule over them. So that's that evolution from Woodrow Wilson to Woodrow Wilson Part Two, which is Joe Biden. And and this is the interesting. We discussed this briefly when when I was on your channel. When I said that, I I started off that conversation saying there's no such thing as systemic racism. There there might, and I I I try to adhere to the idea that. There's, act, there's no racist, there's just assholes. And someone who says, yeah. I don't like someone because they're black, Jewish, whatever, is going to say, I don't like someone because they're fat. I don't like someone because there's... Yeah. Th- th- but, and I said, okay, no, you know, there might be independent acts of racism, uh, but it's not baked into institutions. And then you made the compelling argument. You say, what, the argument you just made right now, social programs that create dependency. <laughs> yeah. uh, Joe Biden banning menthol cigarettes <laughs> to protect <laughs> children and the African-American community because it's a cigarette of choice for African-Americans as though they need the same protection as children from the government. And I'm like, holy shit, those are two good examples of institutionalized racism. CRT. Some pe- CR- well, that doesn't exist. That's just a, that's just, that's a, that's a concept. I'm joking. I'm joking. That was, <laughs> those are the same. CRT does not, CRT is critical race theory. They yeah. said it doesn't exist. It's not being taught in schools. Yeah. Okay, it exists. It's being taught in schools and you're racist if you oppose it. Yeah. Um, but those are decent examples. But then you're going to have people say, well, that's Democrat institutionalized racism. Yeah. Democrats look at Republicans and call them the racist because, I don't know, whenever they have a black candidate, it's a token candidate being exploited for racial purposes, which is more confession through projection. Yeah. But you made a pretty compelling argument for some forms of institutionalized racism. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, you got the Harvard actually discriminating against Asian applicants, uh, which is itself institutionalized racism by definition. Yeah. Um, how do you, how do, on the one hand, how do you break away from it when it's predicated mm-hmm. on hundreds of years of oppression mm-hmm. that um, you have those very same dividers and conquerors saying, mm-hmm. never forget it, mm-hmm. always remember it, you will always be the victim and you need mm-hmm. us to fight for you. Mm-hmm. How do you break out of it? You don't. It's an inevitability. That's not the answer I was hoping for. <laughs> that's, that's very, that's very uh, non-optimistic. Uh, what, what is? Well, where does it go? Can you can you name a time period where there wasn't a ruling class that controlled what people thought? Because power is the ability to define one's reality. So, for example, uh, if we look at um, Soviet Union, complete blackout of outside media, right? So you don't know how good it is in America compared to what you're living in in Russia. And if rumors got in, you know, they just eliminated that person, threw them in a gulag or whatever. But if we go back to Rome, the people with power are always going to control the media and the press. They're always going to control um, the outlets of propaganda uh, just through sheer power. Uh, there's always going to be a ruling class and and a, and a Uh, a follower class. That's what I'll call it, a follower class. I don't want to say the oppressed class because oppression is a choice. Um, There's, especially now. Oppression is a choice. I'm going to stop you there. Flesh that out. Um, I'll give you several examples. Um, When uh, Bartholomew uh, de las Casas was going into South America and ravaging, pillaging, raping, and killing the native population, uh, many women committed suicide. Um, many women went to the water and drowned their babies. They chose death over oppression. Uh, Malcolm X said the cost of freedom is death. Um, when we look at uh, how Haiti uh, freed itself, there was a rebellion. Um, you know, uh, slavery is a choice, which is why we are free now, because we chose not to be slaves anymore. We rebelled, we fought, and we got free. Um, uh, When you go look at communist Russia, same thing. Some people chose death. When you look at um, East Germany, when they had the Berlin Wall, some people chose, you know, disguises to make it to West Germany. Uh, Some people chose to jump over the wall Some people died jumping over that wall. Um, But at the end of the day, it is a choice. Um, And and it's a a difficult choice, you know. Um, Sometimes it's not as always as extreme. Today, it's not as extreme. I think today, uh, today, oppression is more of a choice. Um, That's why I call today, I call it the follower class, at least here in America. Um, when I talk about third world nations like Africa, you know, you're talking about kids and, you know, in the coal tan mines, 
I can't even begin to wrap my mind around what it's like to be born in some, something like that. Mm-hmm. Like you have no concept of the outside world and what is possible. So in that case, I don't think oppression is a choice because that's an extreme circumstance. But again, you do have people that escape that situation. Um, but again, you have to be inspired by something. But here in America, you're not oppressed. Um, if if I wanted to make a case for oppression, I would just point at the central banking system in 1913. I would just start right there. Like we're all oppressed and you can't just say just you. Um, the existence of the IRS is a form of, of oppression. I feel oppressed every time it's April. <laughs> you know? well, yeah, and you see, I mean, say as you describe that and i think and i'm thinking to myself um you know, driving the wedge and saying black americans hundreds of years of oppression yeah lgbtq decades of oppression yeah uh, it, and it is it is in a it is in a fascinating way of of creating all groups of oppressed to uh to divide to divide them among themselves so that there's yeah. resentment among among the the communities well, well let's let's let, let's talk about let's talk about the lgbt community um, it's the government that's mostly been the issue with the press groups and not the people. Um, with the LGBT community, it was illegal in New York at one point to be gay. Well, who was the one that was fighting for, who was fighting the police? The Italian mob was fighting the police and saying, yo, this is a gay bar right here. Y'all touch that gay bar. We're going to handle you. I forget who it was, but there was this lesbian woman and uh, she was married to a man and I think he may have been an abuser. Um, and the Italian mom, I think he went, got her and he said, look, uh, you could be my wife and you can have as many girlfriends as you want. But he, he, he basically just took her in just so she wouldn't have to be with that guy anymore. He, he, she had no obligation with him. You know, my point is that people tend to do good things for each other. And it's mostly been the state that has done bad. For example, when we look at uh, segregation and integration, segregation is a law that says black people and white people cannot mix. Okay. That tells me that black people and white people at some point wanted to mix. (laughs) So where's the racism, (laughs) right? At some point, a, a, a white person in a position of power said, this black dude banged my wife. I'm angry. I'm going to use my position of power to, you know, make these people outlawed, right? And make their lives hard or difficult or whatever the reason was, right? But the fact of the matter is the people without power were always happily co-mingling. Then when you look at integration, it's uh, the same thing happened. This is the state forcing people to come together. Again, it's always been like the state fault. It hasn't been the people. And the issue is Democrats take the race issue and make the people fight. And the people, you go lead a house and we go down the street, white people and black, we get along. The only place we got a problem is when Democrats make us have a problem. You know, with, you know, getting mad at Scott Adams or, you know, whatever, you know, or some random person's opinion online. It doesn't matter. Right. Like, oh, you know, this guy said this thing on the Internet. Does he have a position of power? No. So who cares what this guy says? It's not prolific. It's not propelling humanity forward. I don't care. Some guy said the N word. So what? Sticks and stones. You know, it's so I don't know. With Scott Adams, I mean, I didn't know. I didn't notice where the outrage was coming from, but I think I might have noticed it was actually coming more from white media yeah. I mean, am i wrong is it or does it tend to be when the people feign outrage over uh over oppression and discrimination it's typically not the alleged victims of the incident but rather just other people trying to make yeah they of it for whatever the reason and there's plenty of them yeah marxists explore ex- exploit the minority that's what they do they exploit the minority and and, and the democrats are good at that because I, I play, you know, I got a homeboy from the hood, you know, he, 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 he did time, you know, now he's a successful upstanding individual, you know, making great money. And I asked him, you know, what's the hood's opinion on this? And I played, he, I had him play the video. He like, yo, he's right. <laughs> I don't want to live around no niggas. <laughs> you know, nobody wants to live near poor people once you make it right. Like what do people always say in 
with rappers, right? Right now we have a problem where you're a rapper, you make it out of your neighborhood, you go back, and there's a chance you get shot and you die. Nipsey Hussle, he died in his own neighborhood at the hands of another black man. No white man killed him. The lower class killed him. So when you reach a certain level of income, you're not escaping black people. You're not escaping the hood. You're escaping a caste system which sees you as an opportunity, right? If you come around and you got, you know, a $10,000 chain on and my stomach is rumbling, hey, man, you got to come up off that. I need that chain. I could eat for a few days and I could take care of if I could pay my rent, right? So you can't bring that around the lower class. So when when you say, when Scott Adams said what he says, black people be saying the same thing. So when I asked my homie, like, what do you think about this guy? And he's like, he's not wrong. <laughs> I, I agree. But you, you, you know, nobody wants, like I said before, is three different groups. People to understand Scott Adams. Then the other group that don't that don't understand Scott Adams are either ignorant or disingenuous. And a lot of people are disingenuous. They know that's how people talk. I say it all the time. I told my daughter, I'll be frank with you. I told my daughter, I said, when you go to school, don't have no black friends. Go get you some African friends and some Indian friends, some Caribbean friends. This is what I told her. And I was dead serious. Dead serious. I I, I don't even want my, my kids to have white friends. And really what I'm saying is I don't want my kids around Americans. It's not a race issue. It's a Western issue culture issue mm. i don't want my kids around them go find some immigrants and let the immigrants rub off on you because the immigrants culture is completely different than what we got over here the immigrants ain't doing no <clears throat> no Sorry. lgbt stuff oh no you won't have that happen it, it is it is <laughs> ironic is that it's it's almost like you're, you're you're talking about the abolishing the perspective of identity politics Except through identity politics, which is which is hang with people who don't see um, all of life's issues as being reduced to race. Yeah, and the people and you know it, and the people who appreciate that. I mean, it comes down to purpose and virtues. What is the virtue of this group of Indians or Africans? Well, they want to be doctors. They want to be engineers. Right. This is their focus. What is the focus of an American? It's all over the place. Well, it depends which ones. If it's the American politicians, the focus is <laughs> convince everyone that they are a victim for a different reason. Yeah. That they need to be compensated for the victimhood, which in turn causes more resentment for the specific group that was allegedly the victim of whatever, mm -hmm. thus perpetuating the cycle ad infinitum. Yeah. Flip side, if you dare say... Uh, there are certain historical injustices that can never be remedied without creating current day injustices. That's racist white privilege saying that. Yeah. Uh, and so see race, racist. Mm. Don't see race, racist in the eyes of those who want everything to be a question of race for the purposes of dividing and conquer. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then at the end of the day, perhaps the only way to resolve it is, uh, I, mean, I say just, dis I, again, people are going to say it's the white privilege or whatever discussions that are not individual identity is interesting to understand a person yeah um but people use it to dictate policy let's talk about on, that go for it you, so you're talking about like let's just not talk about it not let's not talk about it but let, let it not be the guiding or underpinning of all uh all political discourse mm. where some uh, prime example yeah i was leaving my own house in montreal one time mm -hmm. Running out of the house, I was wearing a big puffy down jacket in winter. Yeah. Out of my own house, run out, and a security police person asked me what I'm doing and asked me to show ID. Yeah. And I do. Yeah. Now, I'm thinking that if this happened in America and I were of any other, you know, visible minority, well, it would have been front headline news because the reason for which that would have happened might not have been, I might have looked suspicious even though I'm coming out of my own house despite being, you know, five, six and pale. Um it would have been turned into something because you're looking to an, it, to digest anything that happens through the blinders of race yeah. or racism or or genderism and whatever. 
Uh, someone gets punched in the face. Well, let's look for an identity aspect to blame it on and yeah. not just look for violence. Yeah. So I say, look at things without these perpetual blinders on. So but that hard. leads to the accusation of racism. Yeah, but it's so hard. It's so hard, even for me, because I've been indoctrinated for so long. Like, I'm still unconditioning myself to view things that happen to me through the lens of race. For example, today, um, I got off the airplane and uh, we flew first class. So um, we're about to uh, get off the plane and uh, I'm grabbing my luggage from the top bin. And this uh, white lady comes from the poverty section, a.k.a. coach. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I, look, look, I'm just going to make sure of one thing. Okay, yeah. good. Sorry, I, th I thought I was getting a text message. We're still good on 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 both platforms. Eh? Awesome. Okay. Um, so, so you're flying first class. Yeah, I'm flying first class, and this lady comes from coach. And um, so the bin is up here. So I get up, and I go to grab my stuff, and she puts her bag like right here on the arm of my chair. I got my lady right here, my baby right here, and she's just in the way and only thing i'm thinking the first thing i default to is she's jealous because it's a black guy in first class right is that the case can i prove that number one no i cannot prove that so because i can't prove it i usually dismiss it from my mind right now my lady's ready to cuss the lady out <laughs> right you know my lady's black you know black women they you don't you don't want to fuck with them um <laughs> so I grabbed the bag I put it in the chair and her bag's right here and I just I act like she's not even there because it, it's like she put it there to get a reaction out of me because who would honestly do that well let me say this what if this is all and I don't want to what if this is all in your head and this is all and I say a chip on the shoulder not in that to write it all off maybe maybe hmm. this would never occur to me in a million years. I know I'm not, I'm not black, but I was like, yeah. she did it because I'm Jewish. I was like, well, that's, that's, you know, it's, you're not clearly Jewish. And I was like, well, if you know the stereotypes, I'm clearly Jewish. Yeah. But it would never even occur to me. Yeah. Nor would, even if someone were racist, that that would be something that they would do for the purposes of, you know, satisfying their, like, how dare he be up here and I'm not here. Yeah. But if you, it, this is the introspection that comes along with. But that's my default. Yes. And so you, you, you self-reflect and say, Maybe that's, it's, let's just operate that that's not the case. She's, just, yeah. she's, she's a woman who might be, maybe it's the first time traveling since COVID <laughs> and she like has lost the etiquette. Like maybe, <laughs> maybe it's the first time fleeing. I don't know. Maybe she came from Canada. It's like, holy yeah. cows, people are actually, you know. But it, uh, what, 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 what was funny was her body language, right? Like when she put it here, there's obviously not enough space for me to maneuver and I'm moving around her, but her shoulders are like turned directly towards me and her head is like, I can see her looking at me. <laughs> what if this is and I'm just, the airline trying to cause strife among passengers? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm joking. But what if this is just the end result of I think being crammed I, into an airplane like sardines, I, even in first class? I think the lady was probably unhappy with life. That's what I defaulted to because I looked at her shoes. I looked at her bag uh, and she looked like, she, you know, she doesn't have much money. And um I feel bad for her because I've been there and I know what it's like to not have money. I never treated people like that. But um, I think, you know, what they always say, they say, um, uh, what do they say? Hurt people, hurt, hurt people. Hurt people, hurt people. Yeah. So, you know, because she was hurt, she wanted to. And, and really what the hurt people, hurt people phenomenon is about is displacement of energy. Right. Because I have this negative energy in me, I have to purge it. But the purge has to be a transfer. Right. I, 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 cause I, I haven't mastered purging it in a healthy way where it can go out into the ether. Right. Or, or, or it's transmuted into positive energy. So what the unhappy people do is they, their way of doing it, which is very low level and, and easy to do is I'll transfer it. And that'll make me happy because the anger I had, I see it in you. And now it's out of me. It's almost like, transferring the demon right like she's exercising herself but the demon leaves her and enters me and now she's like now you have to live with the demon you know what i mean yeah well i, I think i know what you mean and i also tend to think that the the healthiest way to to, to get away from all of these issues is to say i have no idea what's going on in their life yeah and in as much 
But for you know self preservation purposes, if they're looking to you know, hurt people, hurt people. Yeah, I can deal with spiritual hurt, but if they're going to physically hurt me, well, you know, then I'll, I'll protect myself differently. Yeah. Uh, give the benefit of the doubt and then move on. Right. The issue is like when it comes to politics. Yeah. People will not allow that to happen, and you and when it comes to politics and the and you know the history of identity politics. It, it seems to me the MO is creating an actualable, irrepar- an actual irreparable, unbridgeable divide. Yeah, that only serves the purpose or the purposes of those who are seeking to create that unbridgeable divide. Yes, because it's a make work project for them. Yeah, yeah. But you know, to come back to the point of the conversation, my default was race because that's how I'm programmed mm-hmm. and been that way since the since a youth, right? So. If me, you know, being conscious of this, imagine how people who aren't conscious of it, when you say the things you say, what their default is, right? And that's what I always think about, especially with the Scott Adams situation. I'm looking at it and I'm like, yo, the people that got a default, oh well, man. That, <laughs> if, that's where, you know, if the goal were racial deprogramming, yeah, what Scott said is not it, it's not going to be the racial deprogramming. I think like what you need for the racial deprogramming is like the the the, the who was the who was the the individual who converted KKK members. I forget his. I mean, oh, yeah, I forget his name. But like that's yeah. where you have to have the racial deprogramming. But it also yeah. has to come from the top down where every news story does not have to be looking for the racial motive to an incident, however yeah. innocuous. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, unless you're dealing with like who was that? The. Uh, the UCLA, chick, what was it? it was called, she was called, her nickname was the UCLA chick who was talking about the Asian students at UCLA. I mean, other than overt elements of stupidity like that, the, I think, you know, the, the racial deprogramming would be to look at a person and say she's tremendously ignorant, doesn't represent anybody and is not dictating policy. And she needs uh, to grow up and, and, and learn from the mistake and not be traumatized from the mistake, which is only going to further perpetuate whatever thoughts she might have had in as much as they were ever, you know, sincere to begin with. Yeah. Um, and, and then I think too, I mean, Kanye is the good example. Right. He comes out with the beliefs, he comes out with his statements, which I think were over the top, intended to be parody, satire, provocative for the sake of being provocative. <laughs> yeah. And then what's going to teach him that he was wrong? Debank him. I mean, that's going to that's teach him that he was wrong. And that's going to teach other people that he was wrong too. Make the joke, act like an idiot, and you're going to get punished for the exact same reasons that uh, you, you know, <laughs> you, in what you were saying in the first place. And, I was like, so, and then I get called a self-hating Jew. Like, I'm like, okay, first of all, I wasn't intimidated by what Kanye said. Yeah. I, I, I think, I don't even think he was serious when he said it. And even if he comes out and says, I'm serious. And I said, it, I was like, okay, if you're serious, then let's sit down and talk even more. Right. But what's not going to make you less serious and not going to tell people that you're not right is cutting off your bank and canceling your contracts and ruining your life. <laughs> yeah. That kind of produ- that kind of confirms everything you said in the first place <laughs> yeah. in a sick sorted way. And it's almost by design. Yeah. Yeah. Racial deprogramming. I think I don't know if that term existed yet, but maybe maybe that's something uh, we have to explore. <laughs> you know, that's 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 part of my life mission is to, you know, do racial deprogramming. You know, the other thing about you know, some people say that there's an agenda, you know, to push this racial divide. I want to remove that from the conversation briefly, and talk about the people who work in media. They have a job. Journalists have a, a very high pressure job. And I know this because I spoke to somebody who worked at BuzzFeed shortly because that's how the turnover rate at BuzzFeed mm-hmm. is. Um, and they said, basically, you come in, you have a meeting, you pop the headlines out and whoever's got the best headlines, you're winning for the day. The rest of you go back to work, come back with some better headlines, right? And if you don't make the cut, they cut you in it because a lot of people want in. So you're incentivized not to make humanity better or any like agenda you need to get clicks so now what is the media doing every single time a train falls off the track oh my god another train derailed like the other day in norfolk you know whatever whatever train derailed well you know how many trains norfolk run well, it, <laughs> like it, it, how it much they control the self-fulfilling the vicious circle where like okay a, a traumatic incident happens yeah. now you go look for more dots to connect yeah uh, they did it there was uh i can't think of oh the 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 um food factories burning down right you know there, there, there might have been, when it's sabotage obviously when yeah. it's seems to be fires how many how many of those things occurred before the big one that made it a newsworthy event and now you go looking for the dots that's what i'm saying like the Ohio thing, 
is definitely like a new Chernobyl. Yeah, like and, I don't want to minimize that, that. That highlights policies and f and failures that can't be blamed on Trump, unfortunately. Right. And, and by the way, the story where they were blaming it on Trump and it turns out it was a total bogus story. People seeing the correction are not going to be the ones who, you know, as many no. who saw the original story. Yeah. But um, yeah, so Ohio's definitely like a modern day Chernobyl, not minimizing that. But what happens is because that happened and it became such a big story, now journalists are hitting the wire looking for train derailment mm -hmm. so they can be the person with the clicks that day. And now you see people run to the internet. Oh my God, look, another train. And it looks like, oh, well, you know, trains are just falling off the track all of a sudden. But no, this housing happens thousands of times a year, right? Pete Buttigieg mentioned this and he was right, although he didn't use this in the proper context, right? Because he used that to minimize Ohio. That was wrong of him to do. What he was supposed to do as a politician was say, yo, Ohio's fucked up. I'm on my way right now. You can't go, oh, I'm not worried about Ohio because it's a thousand. No, Ohio's near real life Chernobyl. What I am saying is the stories thereafter. You can't, for example, this is a great book called um, How to Watch TV News by Neil Postman. And he said, if the media wanted people to be afraid of dogs, they'll just report on every single dog mm -hmm. attack because hundreds of dogs attacks happen every single day. And you would just leave the house and be terrified of dogs. And I saw that happen during Black Lives Matter. I'd be on the internet all day. I'd leave the house and I'd see white people and cops and be like, and be like, wait, why do I feel like this? Because I was in this alternate reality, per, you know, created by the news, man. So uh, just my point is, it's not always an agenda. Sometimes it's just clicks and money, man. It's just bait. That much I think we can all agree on is <laughs> shut off the shut off the garbage media. Look at some independent media, the 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 sane, even keeled independent media, and in as much as you get unduly influenced by social media, stay off Twitter, stay off Facebook, because it's a toxic hellhole that ends up feeding your own neuroses. Yeah. And I say that from experience. Yeah, yeah. And I'm a fan of censorship, too. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, literally, I'm, I'm definitely a fan of censorship, as long as I control the, no, the, well, that's the, it. Every, the everyone, speech. <laughs> I say everyone, everyone loves free, every politician loves free speech until they get elected into power. And then, <laughs> then it becomes a, a, a risk to them and not an asset to them or, or a... Uh, a tool to get elected. Yeah. But I, you know, if I was dictator, I'd shut down all media. There's a part of me that wants to shut down some things like TikTok. I say, like, I understand TikTok is poison. It's actual poison. But the slippery slope is, and it's not even the slippery slope, it's just a strategy. You know, start with the obvious cases and then work your way into the less obvious ones. Start with banning Alex Jones and then start banning <laughs> the president of the United States. So you start with the easy example that no one has a problem with TikTok. Yeah. And then sure enough, you're like, oh, well, let's 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 uh, cancel some no, if popular I'm, accounts on Twitter. If, if I'm dictator, there's only two channels available on your TV, Joe Rogan and, 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 and oh, Alex Jones. Oh, I was going to say, at least Hotep TV as well. Well, Free I'm dictator, TV. so they got to <laughs> listen to me anyway, right? But that's all that's going to come to your TV. You're going to turn from one channels be joe rogan other channels gonna be alex jones everything else is gonna be stem <laughs> that's how i would bring watch to the entire population now actually before i forget where so where are you to be found on social media um youtube uh or just go to hotepjesus.com everything's there hotepjesus.com or hotep jesus if you feel offended by that name <laughs> um yeah hotepjesus.com and uh, I said we were going to do something on locals exclusively afterwards. I think there's no time for that. But I'll get to the questions and deal with them, uh, deal with them, address them later. Hotep, I mean, it's two hours and 22 minutes that we've been going, and it feels like 10 minutes. Yeah, if, I'm going to have to watch by. this again and break it down and see. Thank you. I mean, first of all, thank you for coming. No, I, thank you, man. You, we, we, I, you know, I extend the invitation. Say, let's do this. We, hey, we can do it in studio. It's like, I'm coming down. I mean, yeah. it, it, and it's it's different in person. Well, I told you I was a big fan of yours. So, like, I didn't I didn't know your name. I just knew it was like this Jewish lawyer with curly hair, and I was just like. I know. <laughs> Cle well, Kleinfeld. I mean, I get I get the Kleinfeld joke from from. Uh, have you seen Carlito's Way? Uh, yes, yeah, well, a long time ago. Kleinfeld, the lawyer who. Um, but you know who who um, uh, uh, legal mindset. Uh, and Andrew, Andrew yeah. Yeah, Andrew is the one. I'm like, oh, Viva Fry, that's his name. This is the guy I've been looking for. Well, yeah. my real name is David Freiheit, and Freiheit means freedom in German. So it was. Oh, the, nice. The nomen, nomen es omen, as they say in German. The name. What does it say? The name is the. There's an indication in the name. But mm. um, anyways, uh, Hotep Jesus is not his real name. It's it's Brian Sharp with an E at the end. Yeah. 
uh, yeah. and the nickname Brian was, with the Y sharp with the me. nickname was someone who was it was intended to be a heckle at first <laughs> yeah somebody and took it yeah somebody was like what do you think from some, some sort of hotep Jesus and I was like oh that looks good it, I, like seeing it on Twitter I'll tell you one thing it's so <sighs> good that my kids know you by that name yeah and and it's it, it, you are now a household name but okay. uh, but you know what makes it interesting is the uh, symmetry of the name it's five letters and five letters two syllables and Hope it's 10 Jesus. and and we have five fingers and five fingers so it just it just felt right when i saw it on the screen because it was so you know h-o-t-e-p j-e-s-u-s -S. it's just so symmetrical i had to take it from a marketing perspective as you mentioned it's marketing gold it sticks <laughs> it catches and it's good yeah. and people will remember it hotep okay so hotepjesus.com yeah. you're on twitter yeah hotep jesus yep not many people are going to get that there's no hotep jesus 34. no uh no. i can't thank you enough for this this has been amazing and Appreciate we'll do it again that. anytime you're down here and if i ever make it up uh jersey new york All i'll right. ring you up let's do it everybody out there enjoy the weekend i'm off to vegas oh yeah we're doing our first meet and greet on sunday so i'm off to vegas early tomorrow next week there will be more great many interviews in studio on the interwebs and um no show sunday night because it's going to be live with the meet and greet so enjoy the weekend hotep thank you very much thank you everybody peace out